This is Crispin Freeman, and you're listening to Whelmed, The Young Justice Files. Hello, team. Welcome back to Whelmed Reprints. It's the holiday season here in the States, so we'll be taking time to spend with our families and get ready for Season 3, premiering this Friday, January 4th, 2019. For our final reprint of the holiday season, and to celebrate the airing of Young Justice Outsiders this Friday, we wanted to revisit our first Young Justice cast interview. As you'll hear, Crispin Freeman is not only the voice of Red Arrow, he's a highly skilled sound engineer and a scholar of mythology. We invited Crispin on first because, well, it turns out that he and I have mutual friends, a fact that I had no clue about until we had announced that Whelmed was in production. A friend of our family, D.W. McCain, noticed me talking about Whelmed on social media and messaged me out of the blue. It's funny how many people you know who worked on that show, he said. I don't know anyone who works on Young Justice, I replied. Sure you do. Crispin, he said. What makes you think that I know Crispin Freeman? Then our other friend, Natara, jumped in and said, You do know Crispin. You were at my wedding with him. She then started sending me pictures of he and I together at her wedding many years ago. In fact, I later found a picture of my wife and I at a Halloween party years before that, and Crispin in the picture, was standing right behind me, and I had no idea. Well, as bizarre as the story was to me, we still didn't know each other personally, so D.W., who apparently works with Crispin on voice acting mastery, volunteered to pass a message on to him for us. It took months to get the session scheduled, and at one point, I wasn't even sure it would happen, because during that time, I found out that Crispin doesn't actually do many interviews. You'll hear him mention in this session why he decided to come on to Whelmed, and we are eternally grateful for it. We didn't just get hilarious behind-the-scenes stories about Young Justice, we were also treated to a detailed primer on comparative Eastern and Western mythology. In addition, and I don't think even he knows this, Crispin inspired me to open up more about my personal spiritual journey in public forums. If you're interested in hearing more about that, you can check out the storytelling and creative philosophy podcast, The Secret Seller, and an episode called Changing Shape. We'll put a link in the show notes. Crispin, thank you again from the entire team here at Whelmed. You are quite literally a gentleman and a scholar, and chatting with you is both a pleasure and an honor. In other news, Season 3 airs this Friday. If you happen to live in or around San Diego, Whelmed will be hosting a viewing party at the incredible Eclipse Chocolate here in South Park. Eclipse is both a bar and a bistro, serving delicious food and drinks, as well as producing the most amazing chocolate, vanilla, and caramel-infused confections. Feel free to stop by early for dinner and drinks, then join us in the Umbral Room at 7 p.m. for socializing and around 8 p.m. for the triple episode premiere. Myself and editor Richard Kreutz Landry will be there, along with some of our previous discussion guests and, we hope, a few surprises as well. Happy New Year, everyone. We hope you've enjoyed your holiday season and you enjoy this double episode special. Thanks to all of you for the incredible support you've given to both Young Justice and us here at Whelmed. You've made our past two years a dream come true. Stay Whelmed, everyone. Today is almost the day. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D-0-1. Recognized, Red Arrow. That's Crispin Freeman, B-0-6. Update. It'll be like old times. You and me, training, fighting crime, just hanging out, shooting the... You're confused. Probably thinking of the other guy. The original, the one you stopped looking for. Me, I'm just... We get it. You're a clone. But you're not the only clone on this rooftop. And I know from personal experience how tough it was to come to grips with being a copy of someone else. That's why I gave up my identity as Guardian, so that I could figure out exactly who Jim Harper is supposed to be. That's not the only thing you gave up. Roy, you know we both spent years looking for the original Speedy, and everyone else here did the same. We never found him, because the light didn't keep him alive. It was Cadmus' policy to delete the source material. He's dead, brother. Which is all the more reason you have to live to honor the Roy that was.
I'm not sure there could be more Aster in the cave today because we have the incredibly talented Crispin Freeman with us. In addition to being the voice of Speedy, Red Arrow, Guardian, Roy Harper, and more in Young Justice, Crispin's voice acting career stretches back to 1997. That's 20 years this year with the Slayers anime series. His filmography is literally too long for me to read, stretching across scores of anime films and series such as Wolf's Reign, Naruto and Howl's Moving Castle, video games like Call of Duty Black Ops, Batman Arkham Origins, and Overwatch, and animated series like Spectacular Spider-Man, Wolverine the X-Men, and of course, Young Justice. Chrisman is not only a talented voice actor and host of the brilliant Voice Acting Mastery podcast, he's also a mythology scholar, sharing his insights on the influence of mythology and religion on popular culture storytelling. To quote from his Mythology and Meaning website, it is my firm belief that we become the stories we tell ourselves, and I could not agree more. Crispin, we are honored to welcome you to the cave. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me on. It's like virtually being back on the show or something. Oh my gosh. We'll take that as a compliment. There you go. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that our discussion episodes draw on anything and everything related to Young Justice, including both seasons of the series so far, the comics, and the video game. If you've not seen, read, or played all of the material and are spoiler wary, consider this your warning. In this interview, we may also spoil any number of other projects Crispin has worked on in the past, so keep that in mind as well. And with all that out of the way, let's dive in. So our usual question, which is, when did you first see Young Justice, doesn't really apply. So uh, can you tell us the story about how you came across the part of Roy, how you got the part of Roy? Yeah, sure. I had actually first met Greg Wiseman way back in 2001. I had started voice acting in New York City while I was doing theater. I'd gone to grad school for acting in New York at Columbia. And my final year there, I hooked up with a friend of mine who was doing some dubs of anime. He found out that I was a big anime fan. And so he put me in touch with one of the studios that was doing the dubs. And I auditioned and I finally got into one of their shows. And then my current wife and I met and she was a huge fan of the animated series Gargoyles. And for some yeah. reason, I just, it had never come across my radar. I think it was because oh, really? it probably... Wow. Yeah, and I think it's because it probably came out when I was in college. And when I was in college, this was 90 to 94, while I was a hacker and a computer science guy, the web didn't exist yet. And right. I was out in the boondocks in Massachusetts. And so <laughs> I was really cut off from most media for four years. And I remember I subscribed to comic books when I was in college. And I remember big full page ads for Gargoyles, but I never right. had access to TV, so I couldn't see it. So she's like, oh, my God, you have to see this Gargoyle show. And I watched it and I went, oh, my God, how have I not known about this? And there was a Gargoyles gathering that was happening in L.A. And so we went to it in 2001 and I met Greg and Greg said, "Um, oh, you're great. I'd love to work with you. I'm working on this Team Atlantis animated series for Disney based on the Atlantis movie. Um, If you come out, I'm sure we could probably find a part for you. And so I was like, great. And we moved out to L.A. and the Team Atlantis series got canceled because Atlantis (laughs) didn't do so well at the box office. (laughs) Right. So it took it took a very long time before Greg had another project that we could work on, and that was Spectacular Spider-Man. Right. So he brought me in for Spectacular Spider-Man for The Voice of Electro, and we had a lot of fun on that. And then that show got canceled after two seasons. And then right. there was this Young Justice thing coming up. And so I auditioned for that. And initially, I was called back for Superman and Superboy. So okay. um, I was sort of in the running for that. But, of course, they decided to go with Nolan North, which I think was a better casting choice. But in the process of that, they realized that I could flip between a sort of older version of myself and a younger version of myself, which is what they were sort of looking for for Superman and Superboy. And so without any auditioning for it, they just told me, hey, you're speedy. And I was like, oh, okay. (laughs) And then on top of that, you're going to be Guardian. Oh, okay. And uh, use your same voice. Well, aren't they different characters? Uh, No, they're clones. What? Well, it's complicated, but Guardian is actually a clone. He's an older version of Speedy. And, you know, hold on to your hats because it's going to get weird from here. I was like, (laughs) oh, okay. (laughs) So (laughs) fantastic. I was in the dark for a lot of the beginning, except that I got to play the sort of uh, grouchy sidekick. Don't call us sidekicks. And I thought, okay, I'm in. As soon as I saw what we were doing with Speedy in the first episode, I was like, oh, oh, yeah, no, I totally understand why you cast me as this character. This fits much better. So I was I was very happy with with where I was cast in Young Justice. That's fantastic, which opens a whole can of worm of questions for me that we'll get to in a minute. But it's pretty clear. And you just mentioned it, but you could also tell from your podcast 
podcast and your website that you're a big animation fan. So, and you yeah. had mentioned that you had collected comics in college. So can you unpack that a bit? Like how much of a comic fan were you before you started working on these projects? Yeah, no, when I was growing up, all my favorite shows were cartoons. And when I was uh, six years old, my father came in and caught me watching cartoons after school and basically yelled at me and said, you know, uh, <laughs> what, what are you doing watching all these stupid cartoons. And I'm sure he was yelling at me because I wasn't doing my homework, you know. Um, right. But I remember at six years old making a promise to myself that when I became a grown-up, I would still like cartoons. So nice. I have that episode to thank for the career that I have today. Thank you, Dad. Appreciate that. Um, <laughs> and so I'd always loved comic books and read them when I was younger. They were they would keep me quiet on the plane when I would travel with my family. Um, they have right. these big compilation comic book things. And so I read comic books all through high school and your normal fare one of my favorites was elf quest oh my god i got a chance to meet richard and wendy penny elf quest was hugely influenced on me as well and i i'm a little surprised i've only brought it up i think once on the podcast actually i think i i just brought it up in the last discussion session that aired with emily booza man elf quest guys Go find the original run. It's yeah. amazing. It came out in an age where independent small press comics were not a thing. Like there was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and there was ElfQuest and that was pretty much it. Everything else was Marvel and DC and that was all. So just to find it was hard enough as it was. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I read my X-Men and I read my other stuff, but ElfQuest was the only comic book I ever went hungry for. Yeah. There was a day in high school where so I good. had enough money to buy lunch or I had enough money to buy the final collected graphic novel of the original quest of ElfQuest. And I said, uh, I've got to know what happens. And so I went and yeah, bought it. I'm on no choice. <laughs> there's, yeah. no choice. Going, there's going hungry, man. Years later, I'm at a convention and this woman starts walking towards me who's a little older and she's got this look in her eye. And when you're a guest at a convention, you know this look like someone's locked eyes with you and they're going to come talk to you and there's nothing you can do about it. Right. <laughs> and, and you don't know what it's going to come out of their mouth. It could be scary. You don't know. Right. And this woman comes <laughs> right. up and she goes, I'm Wendy Peeney. You may know my friend who's a voice actor who works on this, this, and this. And I go, I don't know who your friend is, but you're Wendy Peeney. <laughs> Right. And she looked at me and this happens to her a lot. She goes, oh, you're one of mine, meaning that I'm one of her yeah. elf children. Right. And I said, yes, I am. And this also always happens. I identified my character. I said, I'm Suntop. And for those of you who have read ElfQuest, oh, Suntop nice. is the young son of the two lead characters, Cutter and Lita. And he's this sort of shaman who can channel elf and spiritual energy. And he's he's this really interesting male shaman character. And I said, I'm Suntop with my blonde hair and everything. And she looked at me and she goes, you are. And yeah. and so she has people like that in her life. I was uh, meeting with her later. I mean, we're good friends now. And, and I was meeting with her later when she was doing a reading of her amazing Mask of the Red Death, which was do, having a staged reading. And there was a guy oh, yeah. there who was filming it for her, who's also one of her children. And honestly, I don't remember his real name, but he had this shocking red hair and pale skin. And he looked at me and said, I'm Pike. And I said, yeah, of course you're Pike. I'm Suntop. And he's Pike. like, yes, you're Suntop. And that's how we know each other. We know each other by her <laughs> elven archetypes, not by our own real names. Uh, so there you go. Did he have like like a, uh, wasn't it Pike that ate, would eat the dream berries? Yeah. Get all messed up. Yeah. I don't know about his personal dream berry habits, but um, he definitely <laughs> was Pike. Oh my God. That's fantastic. Yeah. So basically comic books were always very important to me. And then what happened in college was that I was under so much stress that I needed to take breaks, but I couldn't take a half hour, hour break to like watch a TV show or something. I needed something quick that I could do just briefly and then go back and comic books were perfect. So ironically, the only time I ever subscribed to comics and had them delivered was when I was in college because they were like a quick 15 minute break I could refresh my brain and get back to work so that's sort of my my background and then when I got to New York there was this store on the uh, Lower West Side near NYU called Anime Crash and they had this amazing collection of anime again still barely an internet I mean this is like 95 and so uh, right. you know the first browser had just been invented and so it was all VHS tapes and that was my access to stuff and now the kids just have it easy you know I mean it's just there's content <laughs> Back in my day, I had to walk up here both ways in the snow to get my anime on VHS, and I was happy with my dubbed Robotech. You know, I mean, it was, you know, so, um, yeah, it's been interesting to meet all the people. I mean, I was a huge Robotech fan when I was a, a kid, and now I work with Tony Oliver, who played the voice of Rick Hunter all the time. And oh, it, my God. And it's just very wow. weird sometimes to be working with all these people that I sort of idolized when I was young. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you, because Christopher Jones and I got in this conversation, I asked him, like, do you ever let just, like, because he's got this 
this hilarious picture of him in like a Superboy, a Superman outfit when he's 10 <laughs> on his website. <laughs> and I'm like, do you ever let 10 year old Christopher out to look around and go, look at what you get to do? Like, do you do the same thing? Look around and say, this is what you get to do when you go, when you get older? Yeah. I mean, sometimes it also is sort of like there It also is a point where I look at it and I go, well, of course, this is exactly how it was supposed to go. For, for instance, right. when, when I was in college and grad school, well, in college, I majored in theater, but I minored in computer science. I almost double majored in computer science, but they wanted me to take a class on linear algebra. And there was just no way. I was like, call me <laughs> when the artificial intelligence class comes up, but otherwise forget y'all. Right. <laughs> right. And uh, they would make fun of me because, you know, actor boy, what are you doing in the computer science lab? And it was because I had a certain obsession with audio. And at that point, computers were just getting fast enough to do professional quality audio and I wanted to do sound design in a theater and it was all on like reel to reel tape decks and I'm going guys this should all be on a Mac and we should be running it you know off mini disc decks and you know all this stuff and this continued all the way through grad school where I was both acting and sound designing like sound design helped keep me in the room if they didn't want to cast me in a show I would say, okay, I'm not the actor you want, but could I sound design the show for you? And so it kept me on the project. Nice. That's a great idea to be able to still stay there in their area. You know what I mean? Like you're always there in participating and probably doing them a favor for that matter. Right. I mean, a lot of entertainment is just who's in the room, you know? Right. If somebody's in the room and they're good, keep them. You know, and so I just I wanted to stay in the room. And I met this fantastic sound designer called Darren West, who is now just amazingly famous and won all these awards in New York City. He signs his program Soundscape by Darren West. And the first time I saw it, I thought, what a, you know, pretentious. And then I heard what he was doing. I was like, nope, nope, he's absolutely right. You know, and so I was sort of uh, at his feet of the master sort of interning and, and learning from him. And he sat me down once and he said, Crispin, you're a good actor. You're also a good sound designer, but you're going to have to make a choice. You can't, in New York City, be both. You're either going to have to commit to being an actor or you're going to have to commit to being a sound designer. Choice is yours. You could succeed either way. It, what are you going to do? And I yeah. was like, God, that's tough. I don't, know, I don't know how to solve that. And then this voice acting thing comes along. And not right. only do I get to voice act, but every day I'm working with the fanciest audio equipment on the planet. And I'm like, see, nice. there was a way for this all to come together and work at the same time. You know, so invariably I find myself as time goes on and I relax and let trust that the universe is going to set things up for me perfectly as long as I'm personally in alignment on stuff. Stuff lines up and I go, but of course that was the way it was supposed to go. Um, you know what? It, it couldn't have worked out any better. So, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, I, But I also come to this stuff with a great level of respect and I mean, appreciation, but it's more a sense of responsibility. When I step up to play a character, you know, people go, oh, don't you geek out over the fact that you're playing that character? I'm like, no, because I'm sweating bullets to make sure that the audience (laughs) is getting the experience they want. And so I'm so, it's like the cook in the kitchen, they go, oh, don't you just love this food? Well, yes, but I'm making it for you. And so I'm going to be sweating bullets in the kitchen to make sure it tastes really good for you. I might have a taste later, but I'm not sitting here going, oh my God, I just love these pastries. Pastries. No, I have to make sure you love the pastries. And so that's why when you're in it, when you're cooking, you know, people are like, isn't it great? And, you know, you're sweating and you're dripping into the soup and you're like, oh, yeah, it's great. Can, can, like, do you like it? You know, is it good? Can I rest now? <laughs> You know? Right. Um, so, yeah, there's yeah. absolutely there's a lot of enthusiasm, but it's not the same experience as being the diner in the restaurant. You know, being the cook, yeah. making sure it all comes out well is a different set of responsibilities. Yeah, that's amazing. I remember back in my prose writing days, Brandon Sanderson had said something on um, Writing Excuses, his podcast. And he was talking about how somebody asked him a similar question. And his answer was very similar to yours in that he was like, no, I take this kind of like a responsibility. Not everybody gets this opportunity to be able to... To do this, like all the stars aligned and things aligned for me to be able to do a thing that I absolutely love, and I am not going to take that for granted. I am going to do the best that I can with these opportunities that I have, and that's that's a little about what it sounds like that you're doing. And we're clearly hearing the love coming across in the work that you do. Well, good, thank you. I mean, that's one of the reasons why when I go to say conventions and whatnot, people want to call me by my character name, and I get that. That's fun. But I go, yeah, but I'm actually Crispin, and Crispin is working really hard to make sure that yeah. you like that character. So if yeah. I ran around the convention going, I'm Red Arrow, that would be a little weird, you know? 
<laughs> that that would that would be like the cook saying, "I'm the pastry," and it's like, "No, you're not. You're the guy who made the pastry or helped make." You know, right. I'm not the only one. The animators helped make Red Arrow too. Right. Exactly. So we're all we're all and the writers as well, and so we're all collaborating to make this thing really good, and that's how important it is to us. And everyone knows your sun top anyway, so that would be really weird. Right. Exactly. Right. We don't want exactly. to confuse things. Right. Come on. Don't confuse things. Keep like- it straight. <laughs> <laughs> when I was in college and I sat, sang in my a cappella group, we would sing at other colleges. And uh, one of these colleges wanted each of us to write a little sort of tagline for everyone in the group to describe them, to sort of say who they really were. And we okay. all forgot to do it. And so <laughs> okay. the, the two guys who ran the group, like our business manager and the music director, they did it for all of us. They just wrote down what they thought our taglines should be. And they were all okay. perfect because they all knew us really well. And mine was, elves are people too. And I was like, yes, yes, they are. Elves are people too. Thank you very much. (laughs) Fantastic. Now, after talking about all this, when I was listening to Voice Acting Mastery, you did this, (laughs) I don't even know how to describe it, this flat out genius interview with Phil Lamar that everyone needs to go listen to because it was amazing. But you were talking about back and forth about kind of how things started for each of you, which was interesting. And you had mentioned that you, I mean, acting wasn't always a thing you wanted to do. So, but your, your parents, your grandparents, they were supportive of the opera and theater and that kind of thing. And somehow you told this story about going backstage for the first time. Can you, can you share that story? Yeah, sure. What happened was, is that my grandfather became a successful lawyer, like in the middle of the depression, which is sort of amazing. I'm not quite sure how he pulled that off. Wow. Wow. And early on, when he finally started coming into some money, a a friend of his approached him and asked him to donate some money to a composer who was putting his composition into a competition, you know, a musical competition. So he did it, and the composer won the competition. And it so tickled my grandfather to be the patron of this composer who had won this musical competition that he just started supporting everything. And so he founded money to support the Nelson Algren Awards for short stories. He gave a bunch of money to the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. But his biggest contribution and the thing he was most involved with was the Lyric Opera in Chicago. He was their legal counsel pro bono for most of his life and he gave a lot of money to make sure that the productions happened and he founded the organization that does the critical editions of Verdi's operas. This is at the University of Chicago Press where they go and they research all the different versions of Verdi's operas to come up with the most historically accurate version and sometimes the versions are different over time and so they'll give historical reasons why this version or that version might be used when they're staging an opera. This is still in existence. I actually just saw a production of it a little more than a year ago now of Nabucco at the Lyric, uh, one of their critical editions. It was amazing. So I was a little kid and I was a shy little kid. And because my grandfather and, of course, my father got involved in this as well, they were both big fans of the opera, but none of them were performers. They weren't singers. They just loved this. And my grandfather had all the cast parties at his house. So as a kid, I was growing up around these opera singers with these huge voices that would terrify me. I'd go run and hide because whenever they <laughs> They would sing. It was just so loud. I was like, oh my God. And so they thought it would be really cute if I would be a kid at the opera. You know, they had this term called supernumerary, which we would now sort of call an extra on a set. You don't have to speak, but you just, they just need bodies. And I was a skinny kid, so I could fit in the costume, but I was terrified. I didn't want to have anything to do with this. I was a very shy little boy. But somehow they convinced me to do one when I was in like sixth grade. And so they took me backstage at the opera. And if you've ever been backstage at an opera, Opera House. It's a city back there. It's yeah, so big. Yeah. You have to take elevators to go up and down. You understand why the Phantom could hide back there because like there's so much room. <laughs> Right. And so I would go backstage and these people would walk off the street. Cast members would walk off the street into the backstage area. They'd go up an elevator. They'd come back down and they'd be Henry the Eighth, right? With the mm, costumes and the makeup. And I was like, this is cool. Like, right. that's awesome. <laughs> and then they'd go on stage and they'd create these illusions, uh, these stories for people on stage. And I'm backstage so I can see all the writing on the backs of the set and the flat so I know how they shift. And I got sort of fascinated with being being part of making the magic of being backstage. And so I yeah. kept going. I, you know, I, I was skinny enough to fit in the costume, which is all I really needed to do and not burn down the place. So, you know, right. although I came close one day. But so I did like, I think, a, an opera a year, like sixth, seventh and eighth grade. And then by freshman year, I was sort of too old to be a kid at the opera anymore. And my voice wasn't really right for the chorus. And so I started auditioning for plays in high school. And that sort of is where my acting career sort of started. Nice. 
Yeah, that story is hilarious. I can picture you wandering back amongst the kind of the organized chaos <laughs> that happens behind stage. I mean, the Chicago Lyric Opera is an old school opera house in that in order to store these flats that make up the set, right, they can be pulled yeah. up off stage into the fly space. There's enough fly space that you can stack two whole sets on top of each other. Right. Because they have to when they're in rep and they have to switch back and forth. So the complication of the fly system is astounding. (laughs) And it literally is. I mean, how tall is each set at the Lyric? I mean, it's got to be 50 feet. Yeah, it's huge. So you've got like 50 feet tall and then you've got that twice over again in the fly space. And you have to make sure that they all can slot down where they need to and they don't bump into each other or they don't hit somebody on the head. I mean, it's really complicated. Yeah. And you were how old? Like eight? This is what sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. So this is okay. this is like you know twelve, eleven, twelve to thirteen, fourteen. That that yeah, sort of era. Man. That's crazy. Okay, well, of course we wanted to have you on the show to talk about Young Justice and the experience of playing Roy and working on this great show. And we have some questions a little bit later. But as you and I were talking, we discovered that what we are trying to do here on Whelmed parallels some of what you are presenting through your panels on mythology and meaning. And But I mean, we're both taking something that we love, in this case, uh, animation and popular culture, and using that as a springboard to talk about writing and the creation process in a broader sense. So when did your interest in the mythology and the background of storytelling theory start? Well, I think what happened was when I was young, all my favorite shows were cartoons and I didn't know why. And I went off and I started doing theater, as we've discussed, and that high school theater turned into college theater, turned into graduate school. But when I was in graduate school, I sort of had a a bit of a life crisis. Um, Things weren't working right. My art wasn't going very well. My romantic relationships were terrible. My personal life did not feel good. I had hit a sort of bottom, a crisis point, and something had to change. And one of the things I realized is that I didn't know why I was acting. Like, I didn't know, I, oh, yeah. what, what did I have to say? And, and, you know, I was rightly called out about this by some of my professors at grad school. They would say, Crispin, you move well, you speak nicely, you look nice. Why am I not always interested? This was Andre Sherban, this crazy Romanian Yikes. director. And I was like, wow. wow, yeah, that's bad. What is up? And so I was very fortunate at that time that I discovered two things. One, I rediscovered my love of anime. Between the end of high school when I was watching anime on television and college when I had no media, when I got to grad school, I got to that anime crash video store. And also the sci-fi channel back then was doing something called Saturday Morning Anime. And so they were playing old school anime like Record of Lotus War and Lensman and Project Aiko and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, huh, this is pretty cool, but this looks just like Robotech. And Robotech was a while ago. I have a feeling we've moved on since then. And that's when I was fortunate enough to find this anime store in New York City and started getting back into anime. At the same time that I was rediscovering anime, I was also put in touch with Joseph Campbell's work on comparative mythology. That was coming from my uh, directing teacher, the head of directing at Columbia. She had mentioned Joseph Campbell's book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And Mm -hmm. I was uh, able to find his PBS series called The Power of Myth, where Bill Moyers interviewed Joseph Campbell over six episodes. So I was rediscovering anime, but now I had Joseph Campbell as a sort of Rosetta Stone to unpack why I love these stories so much, because it was a little odd. When I looked back as a Midwestern kid raised in Chicago and also at times in Montana, why are all my favorite animated shows Japanese? Like, why am I not happy enough with Spider-Man and Superman and the American Fair, you know? But all my favorite cartoons were Japanese, and so I had to figure that out. And Campbell gave me an explanation. He explained to my conscious mind why I was subconsciously attracted to this type of storytelling. And it had to do with the archetypal hero journeys and the mythological influences, that I was not the kind of actor who was fascinated with sort of Arthur Miller, death of a salesman realism. That was not not going to be my bailiwick. What I was fascinated with was stuff that either was more Shakespearean or more fairy tale or more classic Greek tragedy or uh, Sufi mysticism in something like uh, Farid Udinatar's Conference of the Birds, that when you had someone who was going on a mythological hero journey, whether it was Luke Skywalker or anyone else, then I was riveted. And so then I was able to look at what was happening in the Japanese storytelling and see, finally, because of what Joseph Campbell was giving 
giving me, the lens he was giving me to be able to understand this, I was able to unpack why I was so attracted to the Japanese stuff, why the Japanese stuff worked differently from the American stuff. And then in, in the end, and it was, it was really enriching as an artist, but I didn't think of it as anything other than something that I loved and I would share with other people, say, hey, look at this cool thing I found out about storytelling and isn't this awesome? Until about 1999, when there was an event at the Japan Society called an anime symposium. And a symposium is different from a convention, firstly, because of the spelling. And secondly, because <laughs> there's no dealer's room. There's nothing to sell. This was a gathering of people to talk about anime and manga as an art form. And there were some amazing okay. people there. Mamoru Oshii, who directed Ghost in the Shell, was there. He was premiering, the world premiere of Jinro, was, he did the Wolf Brigade there. Frederick Schott, who's this amazing writer on manga and was Tezuka's translator for many, many years into English. He was there translating for some um, mangaka, some manga artists. And there was a guy there by the name of Kenji Uchida, who was a producer for Sunrise Animation, which gives us such wonderful anime as Gundam and the vision of Escaflone and Cowboy Bebop and stuff. And uh, he got up there and he said, said something fascinating. He said, when you want to make something stronger than a human being in America, you make a superhero. But when you want to make something stronger than a human being in Japan, you make a giant robot. And I was like, but what? You're absolutely right. And why? And my hand shot up and I said, why? And he sort of dismissed me. He said, oh, differences between religion and culture. And that was it. Well, I was un... <laughs> I, I was an unhappy camper, to say the least. And I think he could feel it because it was a weekend symposium and this was the last day and they were about to close the entire symposium for the day and Uchida-san stopped it. He said, wait a minute, I didn't answer that man's question well enough. Oh, nice. And he said, okay, here's the deal. It has to do with notions of God. It has to do with how you define God and whether you define God in anthropomorphic terms, as they do in the Bible, where they say that we are made in his image. And so you have a superpowered individual who is like a person that you can walk in the Garden of Eden with. Or in Japan, do you define God as a force of nature? So you talk about Amaterasu, who is the sun huh. goddess of Japan, and we yeah. talk about her as a goddess, but she's really the sun She's really this right. cosmological power. And so you have these giant robots that are vaguely humanoid shape. We can think of them as humans, but they usually represent some larger cosmological power. And many times they're made of a stuff that is divine. So that Mazinga Z, which was one of the big innovations of giant robots back in the early 70s, we called it Transor Z over here. It was the first time they put a pilot in the robot before robots had been remote control. So this is the first time the pilot is sitting in the head of the robot. And Mazinga Z, his name means demon god in Japanese anyway, but it turns out that the only metal that can make Matsinga Z is alloy Z, and the only place you can mine alloy Z is from Mount Fuji. Now, Mount Fuji is a god. It is called nice. Fujisan, right? So Mount Fuji is what's called a guardian kami, a guardian god in Shinto that protects a certain area of Japan. And so you're literally making a giant robot out of god stuff. And then I was off to the races. I was like, okay, right. I've, yeah, I've yeah. got to start figuring all this out. And that's where my obsession came with the storytelling was, okay, whenever I see patterns in storytelling that cut across creators... I have to figure out what's the mythological influence, right? Because it's not that individual person that's doing it. Everyone's writing superheroes or everyone's writing giant robots or everyone's doing right. Power Rangers. It's not linked to one creator. There's got to be something low on the brainstem and the lizard brain that people right. are doing and they're doing it even when they don't know. That was the wonderful thing that Bill Moyer said in the Power of Myth documentary series. He says, mythology is the music of the spheres. We dance to it even when we don't know the tune." And so yeah. that's been my goal is to sort of unpack that in as many things as possible. The reason I do it is twofold. One, obviously, is it helps you as a creator. I'm trying to broaden the buffet of possible storytelling options so that you can choose things that are most appropriate or most appealing for the story that you're making. Or you can hybridize them if you need them. Tolkien was a brilliant hybridizer with Middle Earth. He took ancient sort of Anglo-Saxon Wotan traditions and combined them with his devout Catholicism and made this thing that's really compelling. So you can do that. But that's, that's only one purpose. The second purpose for me is self-actualization. Um, we become the stories we tell ourselves. And so it behooves us to have control of those stories. If we want to be the authority for our own life, if we want to author our life, then we need to know what story we're telling ourselves. And if we don't yeah. like the story that's working for us, then let's find something else that works better. And so the one part of it is for those who are creators. And the other part of it is also for, for those, I guess you could say, who are consumers, right? Who may not be interested in making art, but for whom this art speaks 
speaks to them when they dress up as the character, you know, when they're in their Jedi robes, they're trying yeah. to align themselves with the wisdom underneath the storytelling. A ritual is a reenactment of a myth. So when you keep going through this ritual of reenacting these stories, your mind is trying to internalize the wisdom that you find so subconsciously attractive. And if I can make your conscious mind aware of it, then you have so much more ownership and power over yes. what you want to accomplish in life. Absolutely. My wife and I, we have two little kids and she knows I have a very, very active imagination, obviously. But she and I talk a lot about this, the idea of not just encouraging their imagination and stimulating their imagination, but teaching them to use their imagination as a positive tool, as opposed to the negative tool that we as human beings often use our imagination against ourselves on a daily basis. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why I want, again, with Whelmed, taking Whelmed and saying, look, this is a great show. Let's talk about the craft and the art, right? Let's talk about that kind of stuff. But then let's use that to talk about bigger picture stories and what is storytelling about and what do you as a watcher of Young Justice, what story do you want to tell us about you so that we can know you better by giving yourself more control over the imagination and how you use it in your own mind. I was also very influenced by that interview back in college as well. What you just said answers a little bit of what my next question was, was I noticed some of the names of some of your panels, and I wanted you to expound on that, but one of the panels that you do is called Giant Robots and Superheroes. <laughs> so now clearly I understand what that's about, but you also have the Mystics, Priestesses, and Warrior Women, and another one on Knights and Dragons. Are you unpacking those like as mind blowingly as the giant robots and superheroes comment. Like, oh, can you tell yes. us a little bit more about? Oh yeah, can you can you <laughs> give us a little through line on those? I mean, sure, sure. I, I can expand on the descriptions that are on my website. For those who are curious, I have a website called mythologyandmeaning.com where I list all of the different presentations that I do. There's sort of a brief summary of what they're all about, and there is also a trailer on the website for the presentations, so you can get a sense of what what they might feel like. It's really interesting what you say about story. Before I jump into the description. I believe that we are the animal that tells stories. I think that is actually our evolutionary advantage over other animals is that we we're not the fastest, we're not the strongest, but we pass data from one generation to the next so that our amount of information increases exponentially compared to other animals. And the yeah. way we do that is story. I'm not sure why, but our brains remember things better when we tell it as a story. And so yeah. when you're talking to your kids about stories and being constructive, we are raised because we have this long period of dependency. We're 13 or 14 before we can even do anything for ourselves effectively, and 21 before we're of full maturity. We have this long period of, of dependency on our parents and our other authority figures that are taking care of us. And those authority figures install in us certain stories, and they do it usually with the best of intentions. And some of these stories are really great, such as all men and women are created equal and all are entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's a pretty good story, right? That That's not a bad mm -hmm. thing for us to install. But right. invariably, there are going to be other stories that are installed that maybe don't mesh with your personal psyche very well. It is yeah. then that you need to go in and say, wait a minute, this program that's running is not helping me. And right, it's not exactly. the only program out there. There's another way to think about this that could be better. And so I basically have two families of presentations right now. Hopefully, eventually, there will be three. And those families are animation, film, and video games. I've been able to do a lot more work on the animation and the film stuff. I haven't had as much time to devote to the video game mythology. but And also, video games keep changing so quickly. It's, it's a little harder yeah. to, to pin down. But the animation ones tend to be more of, shall we say, a cross-cultural comparison between American mythology or European mythology and Japanese mythology. The reason being is that the West and Japan tend to be the titans in animation, in producing animation. People are like, why don't you talk about African animation? I'm like, because there isn't much. <laughs> like, you know, there's not that much to talk about. So the animation presentations tend to be a, a more of a cross-cultural comparison so you can see what the possibilities are. You may have been hemmed in a little bit in terms of your thinking. And when you see what's possible in another culture, you go, oh, we could do it that way. That was certainly what happened with Wendy Peeney when she was writing yeah. ElfQuest as she was so inspired by Tezuka and was going, oh, you could do it that way. So that's what those are about. My film presentations are a little different. They tend to focus 
focus on sci-fi and fantasy films. And they're not so much a cross-cultural comparison as looking at what's called the monomyth. Joseph Campbell talks about this in The Hero with a Thousand Faces, which is the structure of the, the hero journey, which is similar cross-culturally. The hero has to have the call to adventure. He often denies the call. Then he has the first threshold. Then he gets swallowed by the whale. You know, this is a structure that has become, in some circles of Hollywood, cliche, right? Oh, yes, we all know the hero structure. We've watched Star Wars. We know what's going on, right? right? And so I will go through these films and I will explain the structure just so you can see it. But that's just the beginning. The next question is, why tell this story? You could create a story that would be compelling to many people formulaically by following this monomyth hero journey structure. But why? What is the metaphysical wisdom that you're trying to express? And the metaphysical wisdom from something like episodes four, five, and six of Star Wars is very different from the metaphysical wisdom behind, I don't know, Frank Herbert's Dune, is very right. different from the metaphysical wisdom behind Middle Earth. And so when you understand that, then you can look at episodes one, two, and three of Star Wars and go, why don't these feel right? Oh, yeah. because they contradict the cosmology of four, five, and six. Yeah. When Luke is running through Dagobah with Yoda on his back and he asks Yoda in Empire Strikes Back, is the dark side stronger? And Yoda says, no, no, not stronger. Easier, quicker, you know, faster because you can use hate but not stronger than the light side, okay? Fast forward yeah. to episode two, you listen to the commentary track of George Lucas, and George yeah. Lucas says, well, clearly Anakin chose the dark side because the dark side is stronger. George, George, listen to Yoda. He knows what he's talking about, right? right. You're contradicting yourself. The whole right. cosmology of four, five, and six is sort of Taoism and Zen Buddhism. The stuff that's coming out of Yoda's mouth is like classic Zen Buddhism. But everything coming out of Qui Gong's mouth is Abrahamic. It's all about virgin births and the will yeah. of the force. It's all biblical. And it is possible to find a way to synchronize those two. The Matrix does it really well, but it takes yeah. a lot of work. And George yeah. didn't put in that work, so it doesn't fit. No. And so people go, I don't know, it just feels wrong. I go, I know exactly why it feels wrong. This is why. So yeah. now I'll get to the descriptions of the panels. The Knights and Dragons panel is mostly about the fact that the dragon is so different east and west. So the dragon in the West is Maleficent in Sleeping Beauty. Now you must deal with me and all the powers of hell. Right. And the Western dragon is a fire-breathing creature that hoards two things, gold and virgins. Right. Now, it doesn't know what to do with either of them. It just holds right. on to them, right? It can right. make use of neither the gold nor the virgin. It just grips and so it is this sort of negative aspect of the ego that just grips and hangs on and there's no vitality, there's no life. And so often in Western storytelling, what you have to do is slay the dragon, this fire-breathing dragon, to release the bounty, right? To revitalize the environment, to cure the wasteland. Right. That's not how it works in Asia. In Asia, most dragons are water bringers. They're spirits of water. And yes, they are powerful, but they're not evil. So the Chinese emperor is a dragon and Chinese fathers want their boys to grow up to be good dragons. And so when you look at something like Spirited Away and you look at Haku, spoilers, and you find out that he's actually a water dragon, that he's a spirit of a river, then it makes perfect sense that Chihiro and Haku sort of fall in love in Spirited Away. Prince Philip right. and Maleficent ain't going to have any kind of affair. Like this, <laughs> it's not going to work, right? So when I see that kind of discrepancy and it's repeated over and over again, or sometimes there's bleed through like the never ending story where right. Falcor shows up and he goes, I'm a luck dragon. Well, yes, because look at him. He's long and serpentine like an Asian dragon. Right, He's exactly. not a fire breather like Smog or Maleficent. Right. And so I sort of unpack what that's about and what the different journey is for the hero. Because in the West, you have to slay the dragon. But in the East, you have to sort of tame it. And so the spiritual lesson that the hero is learning is very different East and West. One is a doer and one is a becomer. You know, Chihiro doesn't have to do something. She has to become something. Prince Philip in Sleeping Beauty doesn't become anything different. He's pretty much the same all the way through. He has to do something, right? right? And so this notion of the physical doing journey versus the spiritual becoming journey is very important in how the cosmologies work. And this stuff gets played out in anime really well in something like The Vision of Escaflone, where you have both Asian and Western dragons working together. Ooh, that sounds interesting. I've never heard of that one. The Vision of Escafloni is hands down one of the best anime series I think I've ever seen. It was done by uh, Shoji Kawamori, who was the guy who created Robotech Macross. Oh, and wow. it's okay. it's this fabulous story of a young girl who goes off. It's it, She's sort of a magical girl. She goes to this magical world. And in this magical world, they have giant robots. But the giant robots are like steam powered. 
They're all okay. brass and gears and wheels and they creak and they fight with swords and they're powered by this magical energy, which is a dragon heart, right? They, they kill these dragons. They take the heart out of the dragon, which turns out to be this crystal. And when you put the crystal in this weird sort of Jules Verne giant robot, it works, and so one of them is this giant robot called Escaflone, which everybody is all on about. And like, what's the deal? Well, in the fourth episode of this thing, you see this Escaflone robot, which looks like a big white knight with a sword and a cape. I mean, you, you can't get more sort of Western knightly, right? <laughs> right? Right. In the fourth episode, it turns out this thing can transform. Remember, this is the guy who made Robotech, you know, planes transforming into robots. Yeah, yeah. So this robot transforms. And what does it transform into? The knight transforms into a dragon. The cape becomes the wings of the dragon. The guy who was sitting inside the robot is now riding the back of the dragon. I mean, it's astounding how this thing works. And I go, so wait a minute. You just put the knight and the dragon in the same body. This is going to be interesting. Huh. Right? How do you yeah. reconcile this? And then it turns out the guy who's piloting the dragon is also half human, half dragon. Okay. And I go, oh, bring this. And it's <laughs> it's like... It's 39 episodes of brilliance wow. of unpacking what this is all about and sort of threshold after threshold that the hero has to go through to learn the spiritual lessons and he keeps screwing it up and having to learn again. Oh, it's absolutely brilliant. It's still probably my favorite anime TV series ever. So yeah, that's Knights and Dragons. The The Mystics, Priestesses, and Warrior Women were all was all about female hero journeys. And basically, there are female hero journeys that are available in Japan that are unavailable in the West. It's back to this, are you going on a doing journey or a becoming journey? Okay. So in a doing journey, you tend to slay a dragon. In a becoming journey, you tend to come to a spiritual realization. So Jesus, the Buddha, they don't have to go out and kill any dragons, but they do have to come to a spiritual realization. And so historically, doing journeys are male journeys, right? You have to go out, you know, killer of enemies or slayer of dragons. It tends to typically be a male journey. And spiritual becoming journeys tend to be female. Tend to. They don't have to, right? You, you can have a guy go on a becoming journey right. and you can have a girl go on, on a doing journey. And so I was noticing that when girls go on doing journeys, when they're slaying dragons, east and west, it's pretty close, right? They're, they're going out, they're slaying dragons. I get it. Right. But the becoming side, the spiritual side of the equation is very different. Because in America, we have Disney princesses. But in Japan, they have magical girls. Right. And Sailor Moon and Disney princesses are radically different archetypes because Disney princesses have no magic. They can't have magic because in the West, if you're a woman with magic, you're a witch. But that's not how it works in Japan. A woman with magic in Japan is not a witch. She's a shaman. There's this archetype in Japanese culture called the Miko or the Shinto Shrine Maiden. Right. And the job of the Shinto Shrine Maiden, and if you watch Sailor Moon, you'll realize Sailor Mars is a Shinto Shrine Maiden. She dresses up in the white top and the red pants. That's an indication that she's a Miko. The Shinto Shrine Maiden's job is to protect against evil spirits and also to channel benevolent spirits. Miko can channel both Kami, the gods of Shinto, and they can channel Tama, which are the spirits, the dead spirits, who have yet to go to the permanent afterlife. And so they do this in order to help their community. And there's a, a famous story about a queen there was an ancient Japanese empress who was a Miko. She could channel spirits. And her husband was the emperor. And her husband wanted to consult with the gods to see if he should invade Korea. All right? Okay. And so she channels the spirit. And there's also a Buddhist monk there who helps with this whole process. So there's three of them in the room. And the emperor says, should I go forth and conquer? And the god says, yes, go forth and conquer Korea. And the emperor was like, but wait a minute. I don't think that place exists. I, I, don't, I think you're wrong. And the Buddhist monk says, do not contradict the gods. That's a bad idea. The lights go out. The lights come up. The emperor has been struck dead. Okay. So now the empress is in control. Okay. And she's been told by the gods to go conquer Korea. And so it turns out she's pregnant. So she puts a rock on her belly to postpone her pregnancy and goes out with this spiritual guidance, the gods of Japan commanding her to go forth and conquer and conquers Korea. And she's held up as both a temporal leader and a spiritual leader, right? She's both a war hero and a spiritual hero. Go over to France with Joan of Arc. Joan of Arc has the same issue. She has a god that tells her, go forth and conquer, except she's burned at the stake as a witch. Right. <laughs> right. And that has to do with the religious traditions in the West. When you're dealing with the Abrahamic biblical traditions, any supernatural power must come from God. And if it does not, then it comes from the devil. And so any right. woman who claims supernatural power and is not willing to subjugate herself to the patriarchal hierarchy of the priesthood is a rogue agent and must be satanic. Yeah. So no Disney princess is allowed magic. 
That's so interesting to me because we've obviously been watching like Moana every day right? now that it's out. But I, I didn't see it in the theater, but I saw the trailers. And I remember specifically saying, oh, that's interesting. She she has the powers of Mara. Right. right? And you know what I mean? I'm like, oh, she's a waterbender. This is really interesting. And I never saw it in the theater because we have kids and you don't get to the theater when they're that young. And so we got it. We bought it. I'm watching it and I'm going, oh, what? They wouldn't give her magic. Maui has the magical powers and she doesn't have control over the ocean. The ocean is her ally, which is still interesting. It's a great movie. I absolutely adore it. But it was so interesting to me that my first impression from the trailer was so drastically shattered when I watched the actual movie itself. The only exception to this is brown princesses because brown princesses are not European and therefore not Christian. So Pocahontas can have spiritual powers because she can have a grandmother Willow and she can have the raccoon whose name is Miko. And so she oh, can yeah. <laughs> she can have sort of quasi spiritual powers, but she's brown. Yeah. If you're white, you can't do it. Or if you're Jasmine and you're Muslim, you can't do it. Right. And so and the only exception to this, of course, is Rapunzel, who starts with magical powers, but must lose them in order to have a family. Right. Huh. In order to get back with her family, with her parents and to have her boy, they must cut her hair off and she has to lose her powers. Now, it's going to be very interesting now that they're doing the TV series of Rapunzel. I don't know how they're going to resolve this. Right. And so if she gets her magical powers back in the TV series, this will be the first Disney princess that is allowed to keep her magical powers. Right. Because huh. even Elsa must be tamed. Oh, right. Right? So you look at Frozen and you say, okay, so let me get this straight. A woman who can make it snow is the most dangerous thing on the planet, but a troll who can wipe your memory is safe? (laughs) What? (laughs) And let me get this straight. If he's that good at magic, why isn't he training her? She should go join Charles Xavier and become an X-Man. What is wrong with you? And then she should save Arendelle from a fire-breathing dragon. This is how this right. works. And your main export is ice and you have a problem with an ice princess? What is wrong with you? Right. Oh, so interesting. And so by the end of the film, what is Elsa? An exterior decorator. <laughs> That's all she yeah, can do. A <laughs> it's a little bit. Right. Yeah. She doesn't save her own kingdom. If a guy had those powers, he would be saving his kingdom. Right. So Disney princesses are surrounded by magic. They have fairy godmothers, they have devoted Prince Charmings, they have preternaturally friendly woodland animals that do their bidding, but they cannot have their own magic because then they become a witch. Interesting. Now, this is kind of a, I mean, I may be jumping a little bit here, but are you suggesting that there is, that that this is a trend in storytelling that Disney or other, you know, companies might be applying or that this is a specific edict saying we are not going to do this. Maybe not for that reason, stated reason, but is that something they say, oh, well, if you're going to do this Moana movie, she can't actually control the water herself. Please have something else. Do you think that that's occurring? So I think historically it has been completely unconscious. Right. Yeah. Where is Disney getting their stories? They're getting them from the Grimm's fairy tales. And so right. this has been a part of the culture and the part of the subconscious program for many, many years. However, in recent years, I have heard some interesting things, specifically with Avatar Last Airbender. Oh, yeah. If you watch the first episode of Avatar The Last Airbender, they make a big point of saying that they are not using magic twice at least in the first episode. They say it's not magic. It's bending. Oh, interesting. That's true. Because who is it? Katara and Sokka are on the water. Right. And he's saying, you and your weird magic or whatever. And she right. gets really, really pissed. Now, Eric Coleman, oh, who yeah. was the vice president of Nickelodeon at the time Avatar The Last Airbender was coming out, came and brought an episode of it to CalArts where my wife was studying animation at the time in like 2004 four or five or something. And he was there and he expressed that specifically, that that was a conscious choice on Nickelodeon's part to avoid offending anyone on the Christian right who thinks magic is demonic. These are the same people that protest Harry Potter, right? Right, yeah. And so Nickelodeon does not want to alienate any demographic in America. And so they had to be benders. They could not be magicians. So with Nickelodeon, it's now become a conscious decision. I think from Snow White up and through, you know, Little Mermaid, Aladdin and whatever, it was all unconscious. But now it might be conscious. I don't know, which is why it's going to be interesting to see what happens with this Rapunzel show, right? Interesting. 
interesting. Yeah. Also, the brown princesses are usually the ones that don't have to get married. Oh. Pocahontas doesn't get married. Moana doesn't get married. Kida at the end of Atlantis doesn't get married. She likes Milo a lot, and they're probably going to become a couple, but they're not married by the end of the film. There's a long pauses because I'm actually, my brain is bleeding, I think, a little bit <laughs> on the inside. Yeah. And then to make, okay. to make matters worse, let's look at Brave real quick. Unfortunately, oh, okay. there's nothing brave about it. Bravery happens in the face of fear. In order to be brave, there must be fear. So, either there is something that everyone is afraid of, but Merida has the courage to face, or there is something that Merida is afraid of personally, and she has the courage to face. But neither is the case. Merida is spunky, she's feisty, she's petulant, she's angry, but she's never brave. And she's set up as a warrior woman, right? We don't expect her to have magical powers because she's really good with a bow. And so you think, okay, she's going to solve this problem using her bow. The same way that Prince Philip is going to solve the problem using a sword and shield. Except that's not what happens. How does she solve the problem? By sewing. They have to domesticate her. (laughs) Oh my God, Crispin, you're killing me right now. Right? And why? Probably because it was Brenda Chapman's film and they took it away from her. And Mark Andrews took over. Right. And there's a lot of things I really like about that film. But it's interesting to me that I I think some of this was subconscious, but now it's becoming more conscious that I have a almost four year old daughter. And I'm watching movies from a perspective of if this was a guy, would this be happening this way? Yeah, Belle sings that she wants more than this provincial life in Beauty and the Beast and then marries the hairy guy a couple of miles down the road. Right. Jasmine says she wants to get out of the palace. She feels all cooped up. She takes one ride on a magic carpet ride with a dude named Aladdin, who's a con artist, and then she's willing to tie the knot. Yeah. Colette in, in Ratatouille it says that she's the best cook in the kitchen and she has to work harder because she's a woman. So she becomes the girlfriend of the guy who can't cook and plays right. second fiddle to his restaurant. No, I hear you. So my kind of inroad to gaming, I have a degree in marine biology. So my inroad to gaming is talking about aquatic settings and as a position or place to tell unique stories. So Little Mermaid comes up a lot. And I'm like, oh, you mean the story about giving up everything about yourself for that guy you saw on a boat that one time? Right. Like, And it'd be one thing if to say, I I saw this person and it is absolutely true love and I'm going to go for it. And what I have to do in order to do that is give up my voice, all agency, and I have to wait for him to kiss me. She can't do anything. She has to wait for him to kiss the girl. So Uh, she's in a completely passive position the entire show. Yeah. And I go, what? Yeah, it's super frustrating. It's frustrating for me, and I'm like a straight middle-aged white guy. Like, Mm -hmm. I can't imagine what watching this over and over and over again is like. So when Pixar says they get stuck, they say they go watch Miyazaki films for inspiration. The problem is they're not actually learning anything because the majority of Miyazaki films have female protagonists who have agency, right, who can do things. Naushika is amazing, San and Princess Mononoke. Even Chihiro is fantastic. You know, she doesn't have to go slay dragons or do anything massively heroic because she's going on the one type of story that doesn't happen for boys, and that is the psychedelic journey. The only exception to that is probably Dune. But the Alice in Wonderland story, where a girl goes into a psychedelic environment and must learn something about their own psyche or the nature of the universe, that is a classic female hero journey of going down the rabbit hole. And it it almost never happens for men. Yeah, I can't think of a single example. Yeah, I mean, the the first one that comes to me is the psychedelic aspects of Dune and the spice and everything. And so that has, because he's becoming the Mahdi, he's becoming this sort of Shia Muslim hero, but not by following Islam, but by eating magic mushrooms. Like, he's he's becoming the spiritual leader by becoming a good psychedelic. Uh, Practitioner. Yeah. (laughs) Exactly. Okay, well, that was... Fantastic. But I'm going to try to bring it back to Young Justice a little bit. Young young what? Young young who? Young where? There was this show you might have heard of. Oh. So <laughs> tying this into storytelling, when I said, would you be interested in coming on the show? And you said, yeah. Yeah, I think you said you'd, you'd listen to us a couple of episodes and said, I want to rewatch the entire series. And I was really impressed by that because it, it felt like this thing I'm going to talk about in a minute about you guys as cast members being interested in this show as seemingly as much as the fans were you were like you know what no i want to give this no pun intended justice and i'm going to rewatch both seasons before i come on so how is that experience for you now that we have a grasp of like how you are looking at things from the storytelling perspective how is rewatching young justice now this many years later with maybe more experience behind you in the storytelling front and a little bit of distance yeah well to be perfectly frank I'm not sure I ever watched all of Young Justice complete because we were doing it so piecemeal. 
right? And because there was such a long gap between when we were, would record an episode oh, yeah. and when it would be released. And sometimes I would I would miss an episode here or there. And so I had a general... I, in fact, I missed the fact that Guardian wasn't me later in the second season. We were literally in the recording session and I saw Guardian's lines and I assumed it was me again. I didn't realize that it was a different, going to be a different oh, actor. That it was- <laughs> that it was Matt. Yeah, I didn't know. <laughs> That's so funny. And so we're halfway through the recording session and they're like, we're going to swap out some actors. You can go out and take a break and we're going to bring these other actors in. I was like, but, but, but I have to do Guardian. Like, no, you're not Guardian anymore. Because I hadn't seen, the episodes hadn't been released yet. Yeah, yeah. And I wasn't in a bunch of episodes, so I didn't know what had happened to the Guardian character. And so right, I was right. just coming and doing my part. And so I'm like, what? Yeah. Oh, oh, I'm not Guardian anymore. Oh, it's somebody else. Oh, 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 oh that's cool. That's cool could have warned me so i didn't look like an idiot but that's okay i'm not guardian anymore all right somebody else is guardian great so for me again i'm in the kitchen i'm making this stuff i don't know what it looks like out there on the table yet and it's hard for me sometimes to get out there and see it until it's all done and so when it was all done that it had been a while i was like okay but let me watch it the way the audience watches it which is from the beginning with no breaks with no confusion with no trying to figure out what's going on And let me just go through the whole thing so I can talk intelligently about the characters and the arcs of things. Because that's why I was willing to come on your podcast is because when I listened to your podcast, your agenda was one of a creator. Yeah. Early on in my career, I saw a manga, a comic book artist from Japan say, creators and consumers just don't think differently. They think oppositely. (laughs) And And the phrase that I like to use is Stanislavski's phrase of love the art in yourself more than yourself in the art. So a creator loves the art in themselves and they try to bring that art out to contribute to whatever piece they're working on, you know? But a consumer tends to love themselves in the art. That's why they cosplay. That's why they dress up as the characters is because they just want to luxuriate in the art. But often they doubt that they have any art of themselves to contribute. So this is a sort of 180 turn in your psychological stance about how you're going to approach something. And so I wanted to just watch it from the consumer standpoint so that when I came on here with you, we could talk about it from a creator's position. And that's why I was enthusiastic about coming on your podcast is because clearly you were coming from loving the art in yourself. What do you have of your own that you can contribute to art, to storytelling that might be able to make cool art? And so that's why I wanted to come on and chat. Oh, thanks so much. That's I take that as a huge compliment. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. So could you let yourself go? Like, was there enough time that you could kind of, oh, I forgot about that storyline. And oh, I don't remember even saying that line or that kind of stuff. Like, it sounds like you knew that Guardian was a clone of Roy right from the get go, which is something that most of us didn't find out until at least later in season one, if not season two, and then having to rewatch it a second time to catch that Double X refers to Guardian as brother in that very first episode, the same way that he refers to Superboy as brother yes, in that of very course, first episode. Brother. Yes, of course. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, so amazing. So you have to understand that I wasn't always told everything. Okay. Usually questions would be answered when I would throw up an objection. And not an objection like I'm pulling the handbrake, but more like I'm confused right. and I don't know how to give you the best performance. Can I have a little more information? Right. <laughs> and so right, sure. one of the things that obviously we as voice actors are often called on to do is to play many different characters. And often voice actors pride themselves on being able to differentiate their voice from character to character. So it doesn't just sound like the same thing over and over again. That was not what I could do. Because every time I got a new character that was a Roy, I was told, right. you know, not not like not the guard, like the guards, I could do a different voice. But if I had a Roy, sure, yeah. they would say, yeah, yeah, don't don't change it that much. Well, they're going to think I'm a bad right. voice actor. Yeah, yeah, but you're a clone. <laughs> and I'm like, but they're going to think I'm a bad voice actor. Yeah, yeah, but you're a clone. And I'm like, is everything I do a clone? And they're like, pretty much, yeah. And I, what? You know, so from the beginning... It was roughly explained to me well before the scene where Guardian explains it himself that the first Guardian was a clone of Roy. Right. But, and we can go, I'm sure this is a question you were probably going to ask anyway, I did not know I was the mole. Okay. Oh, yeah. I was going to ask that. Yeah. Yeah. So Interesting. as I'm moving forward as Speedy, and I'm, uh, Red Arrow, thank you very much. As I'm moving forward as Red <laughs> Arrow, 
and I'm all, you know, angry and emo about everything, they keep talking about the mole. And my character says there is no mole. Right. And so I go, okay, great. And then we get to episode 25 of 26. And the end (laughs) of the episode, it says, I'm the mole. I'm literally at home reading the script going, I am? No. (laughs) Ridiculous. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Fortunately, they had given us episode 26 as well. It's rare. Usually they only give us one episode to read. But this time I'd had both 25 and 26 to read before I went into record. So I was like, what? Page turn, page turn, page turn. You know, go to 26. (laughs) And I start reading through it. And I realize, oh, my God, I am the mole. I have been the mole the whole show. And nobody told me. Wow. And so I go in to to record the next day, and I'm just shooting daggers at Greg, at Greg Wiseman. I'm like, (laughs) Greg, why didn't you tell me I was the mole? (laughs) And he's like, well, we didn't want to affect your performance. And I'm like, Greg, I'm not the audience. I'm your (laughs) co-creator. Let a brother know what's going on here, right? (laughs) Because then I would have understood when we were planting seeds that would pay off later, right? Yeah. Then yeah, I can yeah. help you plant those seeds effectively. <laughs> Do you distrust me as an actor so much that I, you think I'm going to like send up my character and make it so obvious that I'm the mole from very early on? No, I'm a better actor than that. Come on. But if you let me know, <laughs> then I can put yeah. little subtle things in there. Like when Sportsmaster looks up and sees, he says there's a mole, and then he looks straight at Red Arrow. (laughs) Right. And, I mean, that's a visual cue. I have no control over that. But there are nuances in the way that I could do performances or say things that could leave a trail of breadcrumbs that you could pick up on on a second viewing. And instead, I mean, they did that anyway, but they did that, like, without me consciously knowing. And I was like, I would have loved to have been a part of that process consciously. But there you go. Yeah, well, there was so many of those things when you go back and, of course, rewatch it again. But that whole the broken arrow scene with Red Arrow and Sportsmaster and Cheshire on the rooftop. Yeah. Where he says Red Arrow and then they cut away and then they cut back and Roy looks like he's waking up. Yeah. He's like holding his head and like he's dizzy or something. And it's something you don't pay attention to. And then he looks up and Cheshire's just standing there casually and waving at him like, did you forget we were here? You know, kind of thing. Yeah. You're like, I don't know what happened. I don't know what this is. And then, you know, it moves on. And then at the very end, you realize, oh, no, he was the broken arrow was the keyword, right? They did a lot of that stuff visually, which, I mean, you, I feel like I've watched a lot of animation, but clearly you're an animation expert in the room, at least. (laughs) So do you see, like, this is something that I don't see in animation a lot. And Caleb and I talk about this a lot on the show, is that the animators and the directors and Greg and Brandon and whoever are getting together saying, no, I want this character in the background of scene 47 to have his eyebrow go up at the 42nd mark. (laughs) You know, like there's like so many visual things happening with all the characters in a room that when you go back and read the body language, you can see what's happening with these characters. Is that something that you see in animation or is this fairly unique to Young Justice? I think this is part of Greg's artistic ethos, which is Greg has always approached animated storytelling as if it is just as rich and visually nuanced and storytelling sophisticated as any live action storytelling. It's a shame that we have to put it that way. But what that really means is that you plan out the story ahead of time. You know where you're going, Right. Yeah. So that you set up these premises and these things so that they will pay off later. And you can see that as early as Gargoyles. Right. That they sort of knew where they were going and they know how to handle that. So when you're laying that kind of really solid foundational stuff, then you don't paint yourself into a corner and have to retcon things. Because you knew where you were going and you're just going to set everything up and knock it down. And that's one of the things, in addition to many other aspects of Greg, that I admire so much is that he thinks about it that way. I mean, you have to understand, when I first came on to Young Justice and we were doing the first episode with Cadmus and the G-clones and the C-clones and the STWV clones. And I was like, this is all garbage, right? right? This is what he's just (laughs) making this up. A quick trip on Wikipedia and I find out, nope, this is canon. This is totally there. And I go, see, this is what Greg does. He researches the cosmology of the world to make sure that it's consistent. 
Now, when it happens in other shows, oftentimes it's accidental. For instance, if you go back and you watch the animated Superman series from the 90s, I believe it's the mm-hmm. Bruce Tim inspired one, right? Yep. After Batman had been so popular. And if you watch the first episode, and the whole premise is that Jor-El thinks Krypton's going to explode. That's canon, right? But it turns yep. out there's a computer on Krypton called Brainiac, which runs everything. And so there's a council of elders, and when Jor-El says to the elders, like he always has in all the old Superman mythology, hey, Krypton's going to explode, the elders don't believe him because they turn to the Krypton computer, Brainiac, and say, Brainiac, is he right? And Brainiac, which is smarter than anyone on Krypton, says, no, he's completely wrong. He doesn't understand. And so the elders go, Jor-El, you're wrong. Goodbye. Later, Jor-El comes back and finds that Brainiac, the Kryptonian computer, which is supposed to serve the planet is uploading all this information to a satellite in orbit. And Jor-El says, why are you doing this, Brainiac? And Brainiac says, well, because you're right, Jor-El, but there's no time to evacuate the planet, so I'm saving as much of Kryptonian culture as I can. Now, this is a computer making an ethical decision with no heart, right? It's saying the data is more important than the people. And so Jor-El goes, damn you, launches Kal-El into space to save him, Brainiac launches his satellite into space, Krypton explodes, and now you have two opponents. You have Superman and Brainiac yeah. against each other, both children of Krypton. Yeah. Now, I don't... It's amazing. Right? It's a really wonderful setup. And I'm not aware that it's ever been done quite that way before in the Superman mythology. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe somebody can point me to a comic book where it happened. No, I'm, I'm pretty sure that that's the first time and it is a drop of gold. Right? For sure. So go listen to the DVDs and turn on the commentary track of all the guys who are creating Superman. All right. Creating the TV series. Okay. And when you listen to them talking about this episode, one of them turns to the other ones and say, hey, guys. You know, this Brainiac thing, I'm not sure this has ever been done before. Do you think this is some sort of commentary on technology and our relationship to technology and how things work? Beat, beat, beat. Nah, nah, we just thought it was cool. We just thought we'd put it in there. (laughs) Oh, my God. So this is the challenge. Greg is much more of a conscious creator. He is making sure that this is going to say what he wants it and thinks it should say. I was so happy with Electro in Spider-Man because they told me, Electro is not just electrified. The electricity is coursing through his brain and giving him shock treatment. It's driving him insane. And I went, oh, that is the coolest idea for Electro I've ever heard. Oh, let's roll. Let's roll. Right. And so that's why my Electro is like so like a hurricane when he starts losing his mind. He's so unstable. And I'm like, oh, it's so good. Right. And so that's when it happens. It's usually because there's a conscious creator somewhere, whether it's Greg, Miyazaki can be this kind of conscious creator where he sets stuff up and knocks stuff down. And all the best TV series are set up this way. When they're not, you get lost where they don't know where they're going. And by the end, it's really unsatisfying because the story has no meaning. In order for a story to have meaning, it must have an end. And when you have somebody like Frank Miller who writes Dark Knight Returns, he puts an end to the mythology, which gives meaning to all of Bruce Wayne's life. And so when you have a story that doesn't have a proper ending, it doesn't have any meaning. You can't glean from it wisdom. It was just entertainment, you know? Yeah, no, I hear you. This is maybe a bit of an odd parallel, but in my day life, I am a hospice nurse. So I was an ICU nurse, and now I do home hospice visits for patients who want to be in their home with their families that pass away. And a lot of people have been telling me since I started this position that, oh, that must be so hard. And I say, you know, there's a really interesting parallel to writing. I don't know what their life story is. I don't know what it's been. I don't know how they perceive their life story. I don't know how their families perceive their life story. My job is to make their last chapter for them and for their family the best chapter I can possibly provide. And it's because when you read a mediocre book with a great ending, you're probably going to recommend that book. I mean, it's, it's an okay book, but the ending is awesome. If you read a really good book and the last 100 pages are terrible, you're not going to recommend that book, right? And it's kind of the same in what I look at when I'm doing my job, which is let's do this so that your family can carry on with an ending chapter that they can look back on positively. Right. Yeah. Well, it's incredibly noble of you. And those people are fortunate to have someone who has the kind of wisdom that you have in approaching that. Right. That that is your agenda. 
That's kind of you, but I'm the job is not difficult for me. It's one of those jobs where you just all, all the all the keys come together to do the job. I hope the best job that I can. Sorry, that was a bit of an aside, but I think it was fairly applicable. The idea that so in, in watching to pull it back to Young Justice for a second, <laughs> this thing you're talking about having to retcon or this stumbling on things or this you know almost role playing game like situation where you're like, oh, remember that thing we did in that first game six months ago? Oh, let's pretend that that made that was planted and made sense in this final scene, right? Mm-hmm. In Young Justice, I was watching it the first time with that mentality. I was convinced that in Image, which is like in the 20s, episode in the 20s, where they finally reveal the secret behind Miss Martian, I thought that was a retcon. Mm. I was like, oh, that's interesting. I'm so glad they heard that we were all really annoyed by this stereotypical 70s teen girl character that I didn't care for. I'm so glad they, they fixed this in a really interesting way. I started a podcast to keep apologizing to Greg for this mentality I had about it because then I went back, of course, and watched it a second time. And the first time I see there's a, and there's the episode downtime, Artemis is sitting in her living room and she's cleaning her arrows and doing some work on her gear. And in the background on the TV, there's, there's the thing that says next up on comedy central or whatever, another episode of hello. And then the TV shuts off because her mom comes in to talk to her and my brain exploded. <laughs> That I I was like, wait a minute, what? And then there's another scene. I think Uncle Dudley is in his apartment and it's also playing in the background. And then I saw the flashback. There's a scene where McGann gives Superboy his memories back in Bereft, where they show an image of her in her white Martian form. And she's in a cheerleader outfit saying, hello, Megan, but we've never seen her like that. And all of these things made me realize, oh my God, something else is happening here. This is not what I expected at all. Mm-hmm. And even now, after having watched it so many times, and it, Caleb and I both, as we're researching an episode, we're like, oh my God, man, you can't, I can't even, you don't even know what I just found out <laughs> that I didn't realize the first 30 freaking times I've seen this series. The whole Calderon's name being like a rephrasing of Cal Durham, who is a character from the 70s. This is like stuff that most creators would not pay any attention to. Who cares what his name is? Mm-hmm. Right? But instead, it's his dad, and his dad is a character that existed in the 70s, who was an ally of Aquaman, who was tied to Black Manta, who, it's just like, and it's an ensemble cast. It's not just, it's hard enough to do this in a show like Arrow, which is, you know, theoretically focused on a single character, Mm -hmm. right, with a few supporting cast characters. Every character has equal weight in everything that they're doing through all of these episodes. I don't understand, I want to understand how his brain works. (laughs) Greg's brain. To put this kind of thing together. And you got a behind the scenes, sort of, except he didn't tell you things. (laughs) It was on a need to know basis. The problem is I really needed (laughs) to know. Apparently. He didn't tell me. (laughs) Apparently. (laughs) Apparently. So what other things did you notice this watching through? Were there any surprises? As you can imagine, obviously, I'm looking a lot through the lens of uh, Red Arrow. And it was really great to see the visual cues about him that there was no way for me to be able to see when we're recording the script right because you know people say oh you're a red arrow it's like yeah well i'm i'm like half of red arrow the other half is the guy who animated him right or or the guy who character designed him so i think that was probably the most satisfying thing for me was to see all the visual cues in the storytelling that would bring things together and also that i could get more into the relationships between Miss Martian and Superboy and Artemis and Wally because I'm not there for those scenes. So I wasn't right. in the room when they were recording those. So without ha- – and, and I would get snippets, right? Because I might read a script where that scene is in it, but I'm not going to be in the room when they're recording it. Or I may be or I may not. Who knows? Depending on actor right. schedules. But it's nice sure. to have the through line of it all instead of just getting it piecemeal. It's like instead of just getting an issue here and there, I'm starting from the beginning and I'm never missing an issue. And the visual story- storytelling was very satisfying. I'm always looking at villains because that's usually the weak link in storytelling yeah. because people don't quite know how to make the villain work. And so it was really wonderful to watch the light and how their plans were working and how it would unfold. And it's always very satisfying to watch plans unfold and also to have 
broken expectations where you think the heroes have thwarted the light's plans and then they say oh no that was exactly the way we wanted it to go and you say well that's easy for you to say but no then it turns out they're right and it because it pays off later in in the plot where it, it was exactly the way they wanted it to go and i go oh, right. no, thank you that's when i feel like i'm in good hands that the storytellers are not going to drop me on my head with something like midichlorians that come out of left field <laughs> and completely, you know, adulterate the meaning of yeah. what's going on. So that yeah. was really satisfying. I thought the ensemble aspect of it was pretty cool. The only thing is that when, we, when they went into the second season for Invasion, I, I wished we hadn't just dropped the first team so hard. Mm. I do love the stuff they're doing with Blue Beetle and all the new characters, but it meant that the relationship between Miss Martian and Superboy was basically put on hold. We've taken a season to get to know these characters really well. We want to see them continue. And for them basically to be in a sort of holding pattern is like, oh, but well, then what happens next? You know, so that, that was the only thing. But I love me some Blue Beetle and everything that's going on there. So I was like, OK, I'll watch Blue Beetle and see what's happening and Arsenal and all that good stuff. Right, right. Of course, when we first... When we first, when I first got cast as as Red Arrow as Speedy, I came in the first day and I was like, "So, do I get to be a heroin junkie?" <laughs> <laughs> and they looked at me and they went, "No, we can't do the hair." I'm like, "No track marks on my arm, damn." Okay, um, do I get to have an illegitimate child? N- no, we have to write it so that you married Cheshire and you're just separated. I was like, "Oh, damn! You're taking all the fun out, Greg." <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. From a mythology standpoint, looking at Young Justice, the way that you analyze these other movies that we dove into, what what I'm assuming is going to be the last episode of our interview. Did you look at Young Justice from this kind of mythological perspective and see anything particularly interesting? Is it something that you things that you've noticed in Greg's work in the past or kind of what larger stories are being told differently than they normally are told in American animation? Well, see, the thing is that mythology influences storytelling. But not every piece of storytelling has a metaphysical or mythological aspect to it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So the mythology of Britain certainly influences something like Doctor Who. Right, of course. But the Doctor is sort of anti-mythology. He's anti-supernatural. He always has a scientific or historical explanation for why something is happening. Same with Star Trek. Star Trek really does not like the mystical, especially when you go into something like Deep Space Nine where they do not want to call them wormhole aliens. Or, no, sorry, they don't want to call them the prophets. Prophets. They want to call them wormhole right? aliens, yeah. Star Trek says, no, they're wormhole aliens. And everyone on the planet says, no, there are prophets. They're, they are our spiritual guides. And Cisco, as a captain, has to keep doing this ping pong between, am I the prophet or am I just an officer, a secular officer of Starfleet? Right? So Star Trek and Doctor Who, these are very, these are not mythologically oriented stories, even though they are clearly influenced by the mythology of America and and Britain. Mm -hmm. So when I look at Young Justice, what I see is that like most American superheroes, it is greatly influenced by both Greco-Roman and Judeo-Christian notions of heroism, right? So that the Justice League looks a lot like a Greek pantheon, right? And they all wear their names on their chest, but they don't act like the Greek gods, They're not shagging and cheating and, you know, (laughs) trying to do all the crazy stuff that Greek (laughs) gods do. They're fighting for justice, which is a very Judeo-Christian notion of how the universe should be organized. That the universe must conform to a notion of justice or else it is fallen. It It is broken in some way. So that is absolutely at play in the influence of how superheroes are put together. But I never got the sense that Greg was trying to make any sort of metaphysical comment on the world through Young Justice, right? As opposed to gargoyles, where the heroes are literally mythological creatures. And so the idea that these gargoyles look demonic but are actually protecting. And there's a big argument that Goliath has in the gargoyles about, we protect the castle, which is sort of an old medieval notion of cosmology. There is an in-group, which is in the castle, and those are the people we love. And people outside of the castle are the out-group, and we don't like them. But then when you take that medieval cosmology and you transport it to modern-day Manhattan, 
right. it's going to cause major problems because now Goliath is going to defend the castle, but Xanatos, who is n- is a pretty shady character, owns the castle. So now he is pledging fealty to a bad lord. Right. What was good medieval ethics back then is now bad. And so there is an episode where he goes, no, it's not the castle. We can let go of the castle. It is this yeah. island, Manhattan. That is what we protect. And you go, aha, right? Now that's interesting. And then they have the whole world tour with the Mists of Avalon and the whole notion of King Arthur and Griff, who is like one of my favorite gargoyles ever. He's so sporty <laughs> and British. I'm on my way, sir, you know? And... uh <laughs> So then you have this notion that there are metaphysical forces at play that have ethical consequences. And who are you going to pledge your fealty to? Are you going to say an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth and follow Demona down the path of whatever with Macbeth and everything else that's really negative, although it kept her alive? So do you fault her really for it, right? Demona probably would have died had she not made this deal and survived. But Goliath has to say, do I, you know, I I love her, but I don't know if I can get on board with this. Yeah. It's similar quandaries that happen in Lord of the Rings where you go, Gollum deserves death. And Gandalf says, yes, there are people who deserve death. There are also people who deserve life who die. Can you give them life? Then don't be so eager to deal out death in the name of justice. He may have a part to play in this when all is said and done. And over and over again in Lord of the Rings, if a character chooses mercy over good tactics, they are rewarded. It makes no sense for Aragorn to chase after Merry and Pippin after they've been abducted by the orcs. The Ring of Power is going straight into Mordor. You should probably help Frodo if you want to save the world. (laughs) Right? right? But two little hobbits versus the world, you go to save the hobbits out of a notion of mercy, he is rewarded. When they are on the steps of Mount Doom and Gollum is literally trying to kill Frodo and Samwise, they won't kill Gollum. It doesn't make any sense strategically, tactically. But it does if you're working with a Catholic notion of mercy. And so mercy, and Gandalf says this in like you know, the second chapter, you know, mercy has ruled the fate of many things. And so these stories are going to try to put forward a cosmological viewpoint of this is how the universe works. And if you want to be in line, in alignment with the laws of the universe, this is how you need to behave as a hero. This is the spiritual and physical lessons you need to learn. I'm not sure I see that so much in Young Justice, right? Most of the stuff that's happening in Young Justice is more ethical than mythological. Do I take this the, these shield packs from Lex Luthor to give me the powers that I want, or do I not? And the question then becomes, have I betrayed my friends? Not, have I put the universe in danger, right? Yes. Or the planet or Middle Earth in danger. So there's no metaphysical thing at stake. Or have I put my immortal soul in danger? That's when you're working on that metaphysical level. And to be perfectly frank, Even though the DC universe has all of these Greek gods running around with names on their chest, it doesn't really want to deal with the metaphysical very much. You have to go to Marvel with Doctor Strange and Ghost Rider before you start getting metaphysical demons and things. You know, I mean, you could make an argument for the new gods, which do show up. And you could say, well, there's new Genesis and Apocalypse and this thing there. And I go, yes, yes, that's classic biblical cosmic dualism and everything else. But they have very little impact on Young Justice, right? We're not actually right. doing battle with Darkseid and the forces of Apocalypse and having questions about that. You know, that, that's, a, that's very much tangential to the main thrust of the world of Young Justice. Right. Except we may end up seeing that in a later season, though, as of the end of season two. So. Hey, we may. It may come up and he may take it in a more metaphysical direction than it has been in the past. And I, I would not put that past him. That could totally be the case. I have no idea what they're going to do. And I won't know. And I probably won't know I'm the mole again. You know, who knows? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I'll find out I'm the Buddha having been reborn over multiple. I have no idea. We've been cloning the Buddha. You are the Dalai Lama. We've been cloning you to keep track of. I have no well, idea. Uh, so yeah, I don't I don't see a huge metaphysical bent to Young Justice. It is mostly personal, sociological, and ethical. Do you go to Rimbor and put yourself under this law court? Is that the ethical thing to do or not? Right. That's different from saying, I'm going to trust the force to help me destroy the Death Star, or I'm going to have 
faith in mercy to help me defeat the Dark Lord Sauron, you know? Right. I, yeah. Oh my gosh. I'm sorry. My brain is like running like catch up with the stuff that you're <laughs> you're throwing out and I'm loving every minute of it. So thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. So I want to dive into a few questions because right now we are getting into, I could talk about this for days, but Neil would kill me on the editing. So let's move into some of the fan questions that we have. It's a bit of fans, friends of the show, and actually some of our own team members as well. So one of the first things that jumped out, and this came up from a few different people, our friends over at the the Young Justice Wiki had talked about, because there were three Roy Harpers with different personalities, you kind of touched on this a little bit. Uh, How did you approach that? Like, especially when you had scenes like the intervention in season two, we put that at the, as a quote outtake at the beginning of this episode where Guardian and Roy are having this conversation. You had said that you basically, they told you use the same voice, right? But James D'Amato was asking maybe if you, did you let the emotional state of the character kind of guide the differences if they're in the same scene together? Like, how did you approach that? Sure. I think often it is a common understanding that what voice actors do is they change the sound of their voice to differentiate characters. It's not enough, though. That can be a trap, right? Because what really differentiates characters is their psychology and their motivations. That's really what's going to make characters feel different from each other. And so even us professionals, sometimes we can get caught up in worrying about making sure that our characters sound different. And we can sometimes forget to do the psychological acting work to make sure that they're differentiated from each other. Many times because we're working with very little time and almost no script, right? So cut us a little slack. We're doing our best. <laughs> but it was interesting because as an actor trying to do my you know good job and make everybody happy, I started to fall into that trap. I've got to make them sound really different from each other. And then they took that away from me. And I went, oh, um. Right. (laughs) If I'm a good actor, I should make them sound different from each other psychologically. And out of those psychological differences will come the vocal differences. Right. Doing it more from the inside out than from the outside in. Both ways can work. I've created characters both ways. I've created a voice and then filled that with a psychology. And I've created a psychology and then found the voice for that psychology. I was doing the inside out for these characters because I realized they were not going to be differentiated for the audience vocally as much as I thought they might be. So they had to be really different psychologically. And that if I stayed very true to the psychology of those characters, then my delivery would sound different. It would have a different tonality, even if I wasn't putting on an accent or aging my voice or doing any technical trickery. Right. So it's a very transparent way of differentiating characters. And it's actually something I learned from anime because often I was cast as similar types of characters in anime over and over again, but I didn't want them to sound the same. And in anime, you, you can't put on a Daffy Duck voice to differentiate the character. It has to sound more cinematic. And so I realized if I'm going to play a lot of dark brooding characters as I do in anime, each one has to be very psychologically different. And I do a lot of research on my characters in anime to make sure of that. Uh, I even Mm -hmm. stayed up all night before a recording session and watched an entire show, Witch Hunter Robin, in order to find out the motivation of my character because I couldn't just glean it. Usually I can just look at a character after a couple of episodes and I know what they're doing because I've seen enough of the Matrix that I go blonde, brunette, redhead, like it makes sense. Right. Yeah, this yeah. one in Witch Hunter Robin, I, I couldn't figure it out because it wasn't about a girl and it wasn't about his dad. And I like I couldn't figure right. it out. And it turns right. out it's about his mom. Like he has mother issues. And I was like, oh, totally didn't get that. But now that I know that I can make him work properly. And they used my lines for him as the promo trailers on Cartoon Network because they rang so true because I had figured out his psychology. So nice. that was my goal with Guardian, with Roy Harper. Uh, and I assume we're talking about Roy as Arsenal as opposed to Red Arrow, right? Right. Or, you know, because well, it's, ha- it's hard. That's how yeah. I sort of, I mean, because Roy as Arsenal is ostensibly the original Roy. And so Red Arrow, do we call him Roy? I don't know, you know, so right. uh, maybe we should just call him Guardian, Red Arrow, and Arsenal. But right. when we were doing them, it was the psychology because clearly Arsenal has a big axe to grind <laughs> about yeah. stuff. He is righteously indignant about things, whereas right. Red Arrow is guilty. He has this deep notion of guilt of not only having betrayed his team members, but also been this thing that screwed up Arsenal's life. Yeah. So Arsenal's looking for vengeance. Red Arrow is looking for redemption or forgiveness. 
And Guardian is the Big Brother character who's just trying to do what's right, which is also a character I've played a lot. So there's this notion of when he takes over Cadmus, we're going to do this properly, we're going to be ethical, we're going to be right, you know, because I don't think that Guardian, and maybe I'm wrong, maybe somebody can tell me in the in the continuity, I don't think Guardian has had the personal trauma that Red Arrow and Arsenal have had. Yeah, I don't think so either. Yeah. He's trying to follow the rules. He's try- He's like a good cyclops. He's trying to do his best to make sure to follow the rules and make sure everything works. That's very different from these wounded characters who have real personal access to grind. Right. No, that's fascinating. Well, that pretty much well answers the, qu- the question. Our next, uh, next question is from Emily Buza, who's a friend of the show, and she's very big into mythology and fairy tales as well. And she says, with mythology, there are certain myths and legends that are regularly alluded to in fiction. She says, Hercules, Icarus, Pandora all come to mind as common references in modern fiction. Are there any particular myths that you feel are underrated or overlooked that have great symbolic storytelling potential for the modern age? Yeah. I mean, to be clear, my scholarship is not necessarily about illusions. Mm -hmm. That to me is really important work. It's like library science. Let's make a chart or a glossary that explains, okay, this reference is that and this reference is that, you know, and I love those because they help me map things. My job as a scholar is not to catalog even though that is a valuable skill, my job or my goal is not to catalog all this stuff, but rather to show how they influence the storytelling so that you can see patterns, right? Cataloging is different Mm. from pattern recognition. So when I see that there are five Power Rangers and the five Power Rangers for the last 35, 40 years have always been the same archetypes, the hero, the rebel, the fat guy, the kid, and the girl. (laughs) And it doesn't matter how far back you go all the way back to 1972 with Science Ninja Team Gachamon, which was Battle of the Planets here in America. Uh, yeah, Battle of the Planets. Watch Battle of the Planets, the Voltus V, Combatler V, the original Lion, Voltron, Go Lion. You go back to all these. It is always the hero, the rebel, the fat guy, the kid, and the girl. Okay, what is going on? Right? That's not, <laughs> that's not about alluding to some, to Icarus, right? That's programming. That's low on the brainstem programming. And I have got to figure out why it's happening, right? right? And it turns out that there's very good mythological reasons for why it is happening. So I'm not in the business of cataloging, although I always appreciate it. But in terms of uh, mythologies that are overlooked, that could influence storytelling, it happens all the time, especially because in Western culture, we tend to get locked into an Abrahamic or biblical notion of storytelling. And so when someone reaches outside of that into a different area, it can be really fascinating. I think of what could we do with sci-fi and voodoo, right? Now, part of this has already been done in some cyberpunk. It's either the sort of uh, William Gibson world or uh, Neil Stephenson's world where they talk about Eshu Lagbara, the law of the pathways, and this notion of using voodoo mythology as a metaphor for interconnectivity on a net. And also, I love what Neil Stevenson did in Snow Crash with this idea of low-level programming and Sumerian language as a way of low-level programming of the human brain. Oh, interesting. So that the Sumerians may not have had massive architecture, but they had a lot of data that survived, whereas the Babylonians had architecture, but not as much writing. And so he plays with this idea in Snow Crash that you could rewrite the programming levels of your brain using linguistics. So I think that there are always things that could be influential, but there's no point in doing it in just a sort of ad hoc exoticism notion, because then you get into Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, where they reference Hinduism and the thuggy cult, but it's just exoticism, right? They're not actually exploring Hinduism. It doesn't have the same resonance as Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade when you're dealing with the Holy Grail. Now they're dealing with the mythology seriously. The mythology in Temple of Doom is just for the titillation of the exotic nature of this world. And it's not honestly exploring what's going on there. So I would never want someone to just throw in some mythological references because that's cool. That's actually, not only is it sort of culturally appropriation and disrespectful, but it leads to bad storytelling. It it means that you you haven't actually incorporated what's what's useful about that into the story so that it works, dudes. 
Right, yeah. <laughs> Take a minute, stop and think. <laughs> yeah, t- there's got to be. And it was Tolkien's criticism of C.S. Lewis because right. C.S. Lewis was not a Christian. He he converted to Christianity. Unfortunately, in Tolkien's mind, he converted to Anglican Christianity rather than c- Catholicism, <laughs> much to Tolkien's <laughs> chagrin. But that was Tolkien's criticism of Narnia, which was it was chop suey. Lewis would just throw in mythological characters from all over the place. So you'd have right. Minotaurs and you'd have Santa Claus and you'd have, and you'd be like, whoa, 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 whoa. There's no, there's no consistency to this world. There's no overarching cosmology that's consistent. And on top of that, it's alluding, right? It's an allegory. It's not a metaphor. A metaphor can be read in many different ways. So that when Lord of the Rings came out right after 9-11, people saw it as a metaphor for uh, the battle against terrorism. When it was came out as a book in the 50s, they saw it as a metaphor for World War II. You can reread Lord of the Rings and apply it to different situations. That's not really the case with Narnia. Aslan is Jesus, full stop. Right. He cannot be Zoroaster, right? Right. He, <laughs> he, he, he cannot be Moses. He cannot be... Muhammad, he can't, he can't be anybody. He has to be Jesus. And right. when you do that, you have, in Tolkien's mind, taken freedom away from the reader. You are fascistically oh. dictating to the reader how they must interpret your story. And Tolkien thought that was controlling. And so yeah. that's the danger of alluding to things without doing the homework that you need to make sure that the world works consistently. It was a revelation to me how Catholic Tolkien was. I had no knowledge of that. I was raised in a very secular environment, frankly. All of my study of religion is like an anthropologist. I'm coming from the outside going, how do you do this? Right. But later in life, when I started researching Tolkien and realized how much of his Catholicism influenced his life and his writing, I thought, well, that's interesting. Because when I read Lord of the Rings as a young kid, I thought it was Taoist. Because the idea was, if you destroy the evil ring, the good right. rings go away too. So in my world, this was a balanced universe where there must be equal parts of yin and yang. Yeah, yeah. I see that. Right? Yeah. But it wasn't until later that someone pointed out to me that even though it looks like Beowulf, no one talks like Beowulf. Beowulf kills monsters. He loves doing it. Nothing can stop him. Gandalf keeps saying, stop killing. This is not Beowulf. Even though all of Rohan is Anglo-Saxon and is Beowulfian, right? Right. Just like the Justice League. They look like Greek gods, but they don't act like them. They act Abrahamically. The stuff in Lord of the Rings looks very Anglo-Saxon and pagan, but the value system is pro-life. And so I go, oh, look at that. I didn't even get that. And isn't that great that I could look at it as a Taoist parable and only later go back and understand its Catholic roots? Interesting. That's brilliant world building. Yeah. Again, with my long pause as I'm catching up with you. Yeah, that's amazing. I love it. And I hope that answers Emily's question to an extent. (laughs) I have been guilty that people say, don't ask Crispin a question unless you really want to know the answer. Oh, yeah. I've had (laughs) that I I apologize if I start to turn into a bit of a fire hose. No, no, not at all. And this is one of the reasons why we have our discussion sessions and don't try and and fold these into regular episodes with guests. Because really what we're trying to do is get your passion out here. I mean, that's what we want to know. I want to know you. I mean, we can look at your resume. That's great. I mean, that's wonderful. But I want to know what's going on in your head. Why are why are you not just who are you? You know, I appreciate that greatly. Yeah. So our next question comes from Kat Cool, who is the, the GM and the host of the Star Wars Actual Play Campaign podcast. Kat had mentioned that she has followed a lot of your discussions on myth specifically in relation to Star Wars, which is not hugely surprising. But she's asked, I'd love to know how your take on religion and mythology as presented in episode seven and Rogue One, maybe influence your past talks, how they might, how your past talks might evolve, or if you saw anything, I'm assuming new or interesting in episode seven and Rogue One. Sure. I I had a friend who said, you know, I liked episode seven when it was called episode four. Right. (laughs) Because unfortunately, the structure of episode seven is so close to episode four. That, to me, Episode 7 feels like the greatest hits of 4, 5, and 6. Right, right. And so I understand why they did that. They're trying to reboot the series and make sure they can bring everybody in and they want to hit all the things that everyone loves about Star Wars. Right. I think it took Luke three movies before he could do things like move things with his mind or do Jedi mind tricks. Yeah, And yeah. then Rey, she can do it like instantly. 
And that's a little problematic. So here, here's what I think. I think that they haven't decided yet. We haven't had a mentor figure to explain to the characters how this stuff works. Okay. We had a mentor in episode four, right? right. The force is an energy field that binds us, it connects us, it binds the galaxy together, right? And so that's basically all we get is this sort of quasi Taoist explanation of the force. But then we get empire where we get much more detailed theology of what the force is and how it works. And then right. we see it in practice in Jedi where he decides not to fight, right? We mm -hmm. see that. It hasn't been articulated yet. I can't tell from seven whether they're going to go four, five, six and hew to Taoist Zen Buddhism or whether they're going to, they're going to try to keep the Abrahamic biblical midichlorian stuff from one, two, three. Right. That makes sense. I don't think they know yet because J.J. Abrams is a great filmmaker, but he doesn't always understand cosmology so well. Okay. Case in point, in Star Trek, when he rebooted Star Trek, you know, his complaint about Star Trek was that it was too slow and too boring. Well, guess what? He made Star Trek breathless. I am <laughs> not going to criticize him for making Star Trek incredibly exciting. Uh -huh. But... He sort of slid over the fact that what makes Star Trek Star Trek is a commitment to science and a commitment to skeptical inquiry. And he sort of threw a lot of that out of the window. Now, one of the things he did in the first uh, reboot of Star Trek, and this is where I mistrust sometimes his metaphysical knowledge because I'm not sure he has enough to really redress it. In Star Trek, we have this problem where Kirk gets ejected out of the Enterprise onto that ice planet and he runs into Spock Prime. And right. then he runs into Scotty. And then the two of them get back on the ship. And then the story, you know, what are the chances that that would happen? Right? It starts to really strain credulity that that would be the case. Well, they were aware of that. When they were writing the script, I heard this in an interview, said, you know, we, we had this problem. We thought, God, this is weird. But that's because they had an idea that the universe was trying to heal itself. Hmm. The idea is that Nero had punched through the space-time continuum with his time travel, with his crazy, humble mining ship that can destroy anything. Ugh, right. that's, another, that's another problem. But anyway, so he punches through the space-time continuum with his time travel and causes chaos, right? He's disrupted the space-time continuum, and we're on an alternate timeline now. Right. The idea was initially that the universe, like antibodies, was setting up highly improbable coincidences in order to repair itself. So the reason why Kirk gets dropped on this planet and just happens to bump into not one but two people he needs to make things better is because like platelets trying to coagulate and close a wound, the universe is trying to repair itself. What a fascinating cosmology, right? That the universe yeah. has some level of consciousness. And that it is a living being that now we must interact with in some way or we're a part of it or maybe we're a cell or maybe we can relate to it as a separate being. Like there's all sorts of possibilities that open up that you could play with. And they went, right. <laughs> yeah, but that's silly. We just cut it. Okay, see, that's a problem because you can throw out <laughs> that metaphysical cosmology and keep it secular, right? And say, nope, there's, right. no, there's no metaphysical. It's just empirical secularism. Fine. But you left that plot point in, which doesn't line up in secular empiricism. Right. So you left this vestigial organ that came from a different <laughs> cosmology. You've got to do an appendic appendicitis. You've got to remove the appendix, dude. It doesn't work. You've got to find another solution that lines up with a secular empirical cosmology, not a metaphysical cosmology. Right. And I go, Ugh. Right. So when you ask me, you know, what what is JJ going to do with the metaphysics of Star Wars? And I go, look, George couldn't figure out the metaphysics of Star Wars. Right. I believe that someone else could. I'm not sure JJ is the man. We'll right. see. There is more reference to it in Rogue One with our blind monk and the kyber crystals. Right. But again, it's just references. And there's this part of me that goes, if he so wanted with the force... Why does he need to martyr himself, right? Luke doesn't have to martyr himself. Luke only martyrs himself when his choice is either spiritual death or physical death. And that's usually the difference between a, a mythological hero and a tragic hero. 
Any metaphysical hero is usually faced at some point in the story with either a choice between are you willing to physically die or spiritually die? And always the hero, if they are wise, will say, I would rather physically die than spiritually die. Right. Now, if the hero chooses that and lives, he's Luke Skywalker, right? He destroys the Death Star and he survives. If the hero chooses that and dies, then he's Hamlet. Or right. he's some other tragic hero who says, this is the way to die. If I am going to die, this is the way I do it. And in a way, that's right. what Frodo does. He says, I am willing to die to save the world. And even though he survives, his survival is a half-life. And that's why he right. eventually goes to Valinor on the gray ships to die. He doesn't go to Valinor on the gray ships from the Haven to live in bliss for the rest of his life. Tolkien yeah. says that any mortal that goes to the Blessed Lands is so overwhelmed by the bliss that they die. So he's going to die, just blissfully. That is the way to die. So with Rogue One, I see the blind monk dying, but it's not clear that his death, it seems trivial. I mean, I realize that everyone there is, spoilers, everyone there is going to <laughs> die in order to get the plans out to save others. So I guess he's right. one cog in the wheel, and I guess you could argue that. But it, it felt trivial. And even more trivial was his friend with the huge shoulder, the huge backpack gun, who just seemed yeah. to go out without a blaze of glory. I was like, at least go out in a blaze of glory, right? right? Very different from something like the second Aliens film with the Space Marines fighting the aliens on LV-426 with Ripley. And there's yeah, that yeah. wonderful shot when Vasquez and Gorman are trapped. Yeah, and they, and they both put their hands <laughs> it, on the grenade, yeah. and Vasquez yeah. turns to Gorman and says, "You always were, and you know, forgive me yeah, for swearing on your podcast, right. but <laughs> yeah, you right. always were an a hole, right?" right? right. And, and you go, oh, "Oh, so good!" Not only is that a wonderful sacrifice, there's no other choice. I feel with the blind guy, there was another choice. I feel like there was another way that could have been solved, right? So it yeah. feels a little cheap. With Gorman and Vasquez trapped in that air duct with the aliens closing in, there's no other choice. And so they go out in a blaze of glory. And not only do they die heroically, but you get a character reconciliation between them because they hated each other. Yes, absolutely. They could become peers in that right. one moment. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. So you've resolved it not only metaphysically, but psychologically as well. Oh, that's so good. I know. Gives you a rush, right? That's so good. So maybe I'll expand this question out then. Then, then what about if we include, say, um, Rebels? You know, I haven't watched enough of Rebels. Okay. Now, that's a fair answer. I was just, I was curious as to whether your animation thing may have taken you in that direction since Star Wars is part of your discussions. But, I mean, they dive a little deeper in some aspects because they had the time, yeah, of course. Yeah, and I've only seen, like, a couple of the beginning episodes of Rebels, and it sure mm -hmm. looked that way. You're absolutely right. It looks like they're really going to play with the spiritual notion of the Jedi in a much clearer way. And so hopefully they do, but it's my fault. I haven't watched Rebels to be able to be able to tell you where they're going with that. Yeah, yeah. I'm totally blaming you for not watching Rebels. But I would say I want them, I, I will say it's, they do try to do some things, but I'm not sure I'm wrapping my entire brain around how clear it still might be. We'll see, I guess. Maybe I need someone else who to, to, to look at it and, and maybe put the through line together. I know it gets discussed a lot. Here's the problem. If the revelation has to be explained, it's not a revelation. Mm -hmm. So No, I hear you. When I watched the first Matrix movie, I came out of the film and I was just gobsmacked. And my friend who was with me, a classmate of mine from grad school, said, you really liked it, huh? I was like, oh my God, that was amazing. And she turned to me and goes, it's the special effects, right? And I looked at her and I said, I could give two craps about the special effects. That's the yeah. best modern retelling of the Buddha I have ever seen. Yeah. And she went, what, what, what? Now, yeah, yeah. You don't have to know anything about Gnostic Christianity, the uh, Gospel of Thomas, or the Buddha Dharma in order to appreciate the first Matrix movie. You will get right. it. You will get the spiritual message without any bibliography. That's good storytelling. The problem is, in the second one, you right. have to know something about Hinduism. You have to know something about a famous story called the Humbling of Indra in order to understand that final confrontation between Neo and the Architect that this is lifted from a very popular story in Hinduism. But if you don't know that, it makes no sense. That's right. bad storytelling. So if you're telling me you're watching Rebels and you can't figure out the spiritual message, that's bad storytelling. 
Yeah, I don't know if I can't figure it out or if I just haven't because I'm getting it week by week and it's kind of bits and pieces. And of course, it's folded in with me doing other things in my life. I'm not sure if it's just that I haven't, like if I watched it all in a row and then like really put a bit of my brain power focused on that particular aspect of it, that it wouldn't like, oh, right, that's what they were doing. But in some cases I am in their defense, my defense. I don't know. I'm watching it sometimes while I'm doing other things with the kids or, you know, that kind of thing. So, Oh, of course. And I, I forget that, you know, I have this lens in mythology that is so finely tuned that other right. people don't have that. So, and I'm not saying that Rebels is a badly written show, right? No, no, not at it all. It can be, it can be yeah. a fantastic, it doesn't have to necessarily have any deep metaphysical meaning, but if it's there, you know, it, it'll hit me in the face in ways that other people will just have a feeling about it. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. And Greg was involved in the first season, which mm. was my favorite season so far. There's some been really good stuff, but we're, we're getting on a bit of an aside there. But I guess that is kind of attached to Kat's question. Anything else you want to wrap up about Star Wars and mythology and those, these new incarnations of Star Wars? Yeah, I would love to see what goes on. I mean, I did like Rogue One. I thought Rogue One was more compelling than Episode 7. It's not mm. that Episode 7 was necessarily, it wasn't bad, but it was serviceable. It mm -hmm. was not inspiring. I thought Rogue One was an interesting take on things because it's this, basically a suicide mission. And so the question right. is there, it's the notion that Tolkien talks about, the notion of northern courage. What do you do in the face of impending doom? Do you despair or do you fight until you can't fight anymore? And this is a very uh, Viking notion of heroism. You know, right. Ragnarok, as the world is coming apart, do you give up or do you keep fighting until the last blow? And so I think Rogue One works on that notion of, you know, how do these characters deal with the notion of a suicide mission? Part of me almost wishes that that was more clear, right? I, yeah. They knew they were going into danger. I think it would have been nice once they left Yavin if it was clear that they knew they were not coming back and that they were, yeah. they were making the conscious decision to say, we're not coming back from this and yet we still choose it because this is the way to die then that's right. now we're into tragic hero land. Right. And that's when you get catharsis, right? That, that when they talk about catharsis in Greek tragedy, it's that separation of being tied to the mundane. And you go, oh, no, that is the way to go, <laughs> right? Yeah. That's, that's yeah. the catharsis. Right. Okay, so our final question comes from Neil, who is the editor for our show. He asks, is there anything that you haven't tackled yet in your voice acting career that you want to do? certain type of character or a situation or storytelling mythology possibly? Wow. That's an interesting question. Is there something you're not doing that you want to be doing? And why aren't you doing it? Chris? Why am I not doing it? Crispin? God, get, get on with that. <laughs> um, make a show. Well, let me put it this way. I am different from most voice actors because as you can probably tell from my verbal diarrhea here, I get obsessed with the story more than any individual character. So right, right. most actors would say, there are these types of characters that I haven't played yet that I want to play. And when right. Nicolas Cage does that and tries to be an action hero, we go, guys, that wasn't a good idea. <laughs> so I am not that. I am quite happy playing the types of characters that suit my voice the best. And sometimes I get to range out into things that I never thought I would play, and that's great. But yeah. to me... If I play a really quirky character in a bad show, it's very unsatisfying. I would much rather play a small character in a really good show, right? right? That's why when they cast me as Red Arrow in Young Justice, I said, oh, yeah, no, thank you, right? Because other yeah. actors might say, I want to be Superboy. You know, he's a bigger character. He's a bigger part. And I want to do that. Right. Or I want to be Superman because he's more iconic. And I'm like, no, yeah. I no, Nolan should be that. I should be Red Arrow. That's perfect for me. You know, that's right. the best contribution I can give to this show is as Red Arrow. Thank you, Greg, for having the wisdom to put me right there. You know, good cast. <laughs> nice. So usually when you ask me that kind of character, what runs through my brain is what kind of stories have I not seen that I would like to contribute to to be a part of? And frankly, yeah. this takes me back to Suntop. I would nice. love to see a shamanistic <sighs> character, right? Yeah. Someone who yeah. is a shaman who has possibly a female knight. So this happens in William Gibson's Neuromancer, where you have Case, who is the hacker, and Molly, who's the razor girl. Right. And so he's the technological shaman. He's the cracker. 
And she's the one who dices and slices people. Right, right. And that's what Wendy Peeney did with her characters. In ElfQuest, yeah. the main character is Cutter, who is a barbarian elf. But he's very wise. He's not harsh. He's, he's a good, noble leader. But he's a sword swinger. And then he meets Lita, who is this desert elf who has healing powers. She has magical powers. This is your traditional dragon slayer and magic user, right? The dragon slayer's right. male, the magic user's female. Then right. when they have children who are now biracial, which is really cool, right? Yeah. She switches the gender roles. So now yeah. Ember, the young girl, is the tomboy who acts like her father and is going to be the leader of the wolf riders. Yeah. And the young boy, Suntop, is the shaman. Now yeah. that is, this also happens in Native American storytelling, where you have two leaders of the tribe. You have Killer of Enemies, who is the chieftain, and Child of the Waters, who is the shaman. Both are necessary to keep the tribe healthy. We also see it in anime storytelling. It's the Red Oni, Blue Oni thing, where you have Maverick and Iceman, right? Where mm -hmm. you, you Killer yeah. of Enemies, Child of the Waters. And so I have always gravitated towards the Child of the Waters, towards the shaman character. When I was younger, I used to sort of identify with Legolas as I've gotten older and I consider myself more of a lore master. I feel more like Elrond. Mm -hmm. And so that sort of notion of spiritual power would be awesome. Right now, we frankly need more women. I want to see more Scarlet Witches, right? Yeah. That scene- Yeah, for sure. In the Avengers film where she, Hawkeye gives her the pep talk and then she storms out of that room and just starts taking people out left and right with her magical powers- that, we need more of that, right? Yeah. Joss Whedon has done it in Buffy and in Firefly with a woman who can kick physical butt, right, with, with Buffy and with River. But we don't see it enough with spiritual power. Uh, when I saw Scarlet Witch came out, I was like, oh, thank God, a woman who can have magical power and kick butt, you know, like, thank you. So we need more yeah. of that right now to balance some of the storytelling scales. But eventually, I would love to get to the point where we could have the spiritual hero who is a guy who can be that and is admired and isn't just thought that he's weak, ineffectual, fey, you know, that that can be as equally as powerful as the sword swinger and then have a female knight. That would be pretty cool. That sounds fantastic to me. I had a really stupid grin on my face when you were talking about Ember and Suntop because I just realized that's the description of my children. <laughs> And do you know that Wendy was approached, I believe in the 80s, to make an animated series of ElfQuest? I'm well aware. I have the old magazine-sized, original magazine-sized black and whites of ElfQuest where they talk about it in like, oh, we're in talks and we're doing all this stuff. But that was in 84, 83. Do you know what one of the reasons why it did not go through? No. I don't, they I... wanted to switch. They wanted to switch Ember and Suntop. They said, oh, look, come this, on. this is really cool, but Suntop has to be the dragon slayer and Ember has to be the magical girl, just like Cutter and Lita. And she oh said, my God, that no, makes me that's so mad. That's not so how the story mad. works. <laughs> and so they said, well, then we can't make the show. And Wendy said, well, screw you. <laughs> yeah. My story is more important than your getting commercial advertising. Sorry. I don't even know what to say to that. It makes me <laughs> furious. This is why my brain went to Japan to watch a lot of storytelling. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. All right. Thanks so much for spending time with us in the cave, Crispin. Where can people find you out here on Earth Prime? Sure. Well, obviously, you can go to CrispinFreeman.com, which is my voice acting website, and it has my demos and whatnot. But on there, there are links to my two main websites, one about my voice acting mastery podcast which is at voiceactingmastery.com. I've been running the podcast now six years, five, six years. It's been a while. I have to remember what year it started. I think 2011. Yeah, I think it started in 2011. And so if you're interested in pursuing a professional career in voice acting, you can go to voiceactingmastery.com and download all, at this point, 122 episodes of the podcast. There's also a sister podcast that I started a little more than a year ago called the Voice Acting Mastery Field Report with young voice actors who are just starting in their careers because the oh, challenges nice. they're facing are very different from the challenges I faced 20 years ago. And so I always want to keep the information relevant. And so they're doing some really great work. So check out both the main podcast and the Field Report, the sister podcast, really good information about uh, what it takes to work as a professional uh, voice actor. 
Um, and then obviously my mythology scholarship is, there's a link there on crispinfreeman.com to mythologyandmeaning.com. That's why I, I called it that is because it, it's the meaning that is for me the most vital thing. It's the only reason for me to unpack all of this stuff technically or structurally is to have a deeper understanding of the meaning of why we tell these stories over and over again. So crispinfreeman.com, voiceactingmastery.com, and mythologyandmeaning.com, those tend to be the triumvirate of websites where my <laughs> information is dispensed. Fantastic. All right. Thanks to everyone for sharing some time with us. You can find us on Twitter at The YJ Files, on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash crashingthemode, and on our website, www.crashingthemode.com. If you aren't already a Crispin Freeman fan from his two decades of voice work, I'm hoping this opened your eyes to the range of his talents. If you are already a fan of his work, I hope this discussion sends you to both the Mythology and Meaning website and Crispin's in-person speaking events. If you're an aspiring or professional voice actor, as he just mentioned, and want to learn more, I cannot recommend voice acting mastery enough. Of course, it's high production quality and content are what you might expect, but for me, not being a voice actor, the interviews with industry people like Phil Lamar dive deeper into the ups and downs that's relative to any creative career. If you want more Young Justice, the fastest way to get it is to hashtag buy comics on comicsology.com and encourage everyone you know to do so as well. Buying the comics digitally shows DC that we want more of the things that you love. If you enjoy our show, please consider sharing it with a friend. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review. The ratings really do help the show. If you'd like to support the show and getting more reviews, discussions, and interviews such as this, then please consider linking over to www.patreon.com slash crashing the mode and pledging a few dollars a month. As a thank you, we're offering access to our episode outlines, Young Justice-inspired role-playing game adventures, in-depth articles on subjects we've only touched on in the show, a free copy of The Masks RPG from Magpie Games, and more. And even though Season 3 has been officially announced, please continue to spread the word to friends and family about the series. And as always, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our computer is voiced by Madison Ray. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. <laughs>